Rob, we are live. Welcome. Well, welcome, Imagination <laughs> Connoisseurs. This is a Post Geek Singularity live stream for members, a members only live stream. Very exciting. Roberto Suarez made this possible, as he always does. When we can. It's been a while. It's been a while, but I'm glad that we're finally uh, we're finally here. So, uh, with yeah, us... sorry, it's a little late. I was doing a live stream with Az and I had to go run an errand. Yeah, we, now... we know that the times got screwed up and the communication got a little messy. It was all last minute, but glad to know that we've got a, a healthy me a membership uh, joining us here today. So, we're yes, going to go ahead we haven't and, done... uh, it's been too long since I've seen everybody. So this is good. Yes, this is good. Good. This is good. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up the floodgates, Rob. Are you ready? I am prepared. Here we go. Boom. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, so it's very exciting. Hello, It's always everyone. very exciting when the when our members join look at everybody's, us and come in. Everybody is here. Oh, look at everybody. I love seeing everybody. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Greetings, everyone. And as always, remember that if you are in the members only chat, you should be in the Zoom chat. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand using the Zoom controls so that we can uh, bring in, bring up your questions. And, yes. or or comments and have your uh, your comments here with Rob and, and you know typically we try to limit it to about 10 minutes per uh, member yeah I, I I don't have as much time as I've used usually have okay. today because I'm late as it is so but I'll, um, be, I'll be mindful of, of keeping track of everybody's time for you Rob so you know oh all right all righty so we're gonna Hello, start everyone. things off uh, let's see in the order that uh, that we uh, of hand raises here we've got Tom Jr. Jackson kicking us off what's up buddy so let me uh, the, the you... Mr. Goof Emeritus himself uh, Tom you should be able to unmute now welcome hello can you hear me can hear you sir all right how's it going it's going it's go a little busy you know it's it's um I've been working on a new movie. Wow. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, there's Gabe Bologna directed another film before Tango Shalom that um, it never was released, and we're we're resurrecting it, and um, it's it's actually a really great movie, and it's it's very different than Tango Shalom. So we are we are doing that. I've been I've been busy doing that, preparing it for 4K, and uh, it's quite it's it's quite different than Tango Shalom. <laughs> So, but yeah, that's, nice. I've been doing a lot of that. I mean, between streaming, I mean, I've just, it's been crazy, crazy busy, but in a good way, you know, and then is of course, a show tonight? yes, yes, there is, there is going to be a midnight musing show tonight at nine o'clock and I'm not going to go for eight hours. It's going to be in and out, you know, a nice <laughs> I was manageable two hour stream. Hours too. That was crazy. I, I don't even know how that even happened. I didn't even know until like the next day, people like you stream for eight hours. I'm like, really? Did we? Yeah, well, it went like this, you know. Okay, well, we should let you go. Okay, well, hey, guess what? Let me tell you about this. And it went on for another hour and a half. And then it ended, and then you came back, and you started finishing Super Chats. Well, yeah. <laughs> Which I, you got to finish those. Um, yeah. But, uh, it yeah. Was no, like that, that little post-credit scene. That was wait, a, wait, we're not done yet. <laughs> that, was a, that was fun. That was very fun. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't like the Halloween episode. Where I fell asleep. Could do that again, man. Was that last year? Was that that was two years ago? Was yeah. it? Yeah. No, that was last year. Was it last year? No, I think I yeah, fell asleep because, two years because, ago because I think it was two um, years ago. No, because it was Wandavision. Because you had the sword shirt on. Yeah. So. So. Oh, Wandavision was early 2021. So you're yeah, you're probably right. Really, last yeah. October. Wow. I guess that was almost a year yeah. ago, so maybe that makes sense. That's some crazy. Yeah. Those are crazy times. <laughs> yeah, I even I got a uh, dead Doctor Strange. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I uh, I love that. That is great. I got the. I finally so got my Top Gun. I finally got my. Did you hear about Top Gun? About the steel book? No, no, Top Gun is now number six. Oh, did it, it? It passed in what was it, Infinity War? 
at past Infinity War. <laughs> That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And That's from what I was told, it's coming out physically in November, November yes. 1st or something like that. Yeah, because I pre-ordered that steelbook. Digitally next week? Yeah, digitally next week, and then the steelbook comes out, the physical media comes out in November. Did you get this? Your steelbook of Red Dawn? <laughs> no, I did get... The original get, from um, Wolverine. Black Phone. Oh, Nice. I got Black Phone. I got the extended edition of Jurassic World, uh, Dominion, and I got uh, Transylvania Six Five Thousand, and I got Event Horizon. Nice. I actually know the director of Transylvania Six Five Thousand. Um, Rudy, Rudy DeLuca. Rudy DeLuca. I, I when we showed Tango Shalom, he came and saw it. He was a really good friend of Joe Joe Bologna's. So yeah, no, what I, you know, there, there is no, let's get physical media tomorrow. And Dieter doesn't know that. <laughs> He's in the chat. So he probably doesn't. Oh, well it. now, you know, Dieter, I can't, I, I'm, I cannot confirm nor deny that I'm going to somebody's house to watch 10 episodes of something I've already seen <laughs> <laughs> again to give notes. I can't confirm nor deny that. But boy, do I have pictures on my phone you'd like to see. <laughs> Especially you fans you. of Starship pornography. <laughs> you know, that's, that's my favorite thing to, to watch on Discord is people, well, Robert said this about it. I don't know about that. And people are debating this. Whether or not I'm telling and the truth. Everyone thinks, I don't, I don't understand. Like, like, I don't lie about that kind of stuff. <laughs> No, I mean, if you're coming out and saying you don't like Discovery, why would you start lying? Oh, I, season three of Picard, excellent, excellent. Oh, why I would tell lie? you if I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> I would. <laughs> no, I. It, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's a, an entirely different show. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's an entirely different show, but it, you know what I love about it is it's like seeing um, Sandman, for instance, N Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Um, uh, Neil Gaiman's Sandman, obviously, he controlled. A lot of people are are talking about certain changes that were made to the narrative. Like they've had to they've had to take out a lot of the DC stuff that was in it, and I think that's made the show better because the Sandman comic. While it had great issues, the first seven issues are really, really, the first eight issues are all part of what's a, a book called Preludes and Nocturnes. Mm -hmm. And they're they're really good, but there's a lot of, he, Neil Gaiman was kind of finding his way, and it wasn't until the storyline, The Sound of Her Wings, that they yeah. use in episode six of the series, that it really became The Sandman. <laughs> um, so yeah. um, I have the both volumes of the Audible. Oh, they're amazing. Um, yeah, they're, they're, the Audible is amazing. You know, what else is amazing is the locking key from Audible. That's yeah. like thirteen hours long. And yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, no, those are those are amazing. Mm. Um, I need to ask you a question. And have you sent that hat out yet? Yes, and I actually have the tracking number. I don't have it with me. I was gonna. I, I remember I was gonna send it. I was f forgot I was going to. I have to get the slip and read the tracking number. He should have it. All I right. think I'm, it's Tuesday. It goes to Colorado, I think. Is it Colorado it's going to? I think so. Yeah. And I, I put a special surprise. Like There's a special surprise in the box. Something extra. But then I, I'm not going to say what it is because if I said what it is, it would be not well, then a it's surprise. not a surprise. It's not a surprise. Yeah. No, it took me a while to get that out. I actually have that and I packed up a, another, another, uh, when I went to FedEx and I have another sh figure I had to send as well, but uh, you still got to send just, I think it's Justin Toner, his Nazis. I've his got all that. Rock. There's a stack. I got stuff for Dieter. Now that I, I know where I can go here, I've got, I have to go down and, and uh, I have a stack of things that I have packed up that I wasn't, you know, cause I think he won that figure. What? Three weeks ago, three weeks ago. And uh, yeah, something like I've been that. trying to get everything out of here that, uh, but that's, that figure is a great, I, I mean, I have one too, but that's a great figure. That figure is worth a lot of money. That is not a cheap ass figure. 
And so when when you uh, can get the, um, I'll have it tonight. I'll have the the. Uh, yeah, just just send it to my um, Twitter, and then I'll hand it to you know, send it to him, and that way, uh, if he wants to track it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad that. And Justin, are going I, I I know it's been two. I know he's been waiting two years, but I haven't. I even have the uh, the uh, the um, the post-it that Dita wrote on it that says your name. <laughs> it says Justin <laughs> Teller. <laughs> Don't worry, so you Justin will get it. I promise. It's only been two years, but you will get it. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I've had stuff for Dita longer than that. One day, I'm going to send him a special edition of the Abyss. <laughs> no, but all that stuff that it's all going out because I have to get it all out of here. So and and yes, uh, Mikey, uh, Mikey, I remember I've got the super chats which I'll address this evening on um, midnight on midnight musings. And congratulations on your job at Krispy Kreme, Rob. Oh, did you like that? I really appreciate it. I was the, you know I'm the employee of the month, and thanks for that. <laughs> that was hilarious. Taylor. So Bron, uh, John Campia hired a new assistant Taylor who I love and he brought in Krispy Kreme donuts but for whatever reason they gave him the Krispy Kreme donut hats I mean I do they give those out can anybody get one so we all just so. we all just put them on I thought that was hilarious why wouldn't we <laughs> you know I did a uh, I did a poll on Twitter about the uh, changing of the movie po uh, artwork you know on, on movies and stuff. It's interesting. About sixty-one percent likes to keep it old school, you know, like just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Nine percent, yeah, I like it. And then uh, twenty-nine percent don't. Care. Well, I'm I mean, getting a lot of responses on that. Well, and what's really interesting? Like, well, you know, this week they've been releasing the Indiana Jones movies, uh, the steel books, the, and they've got the original key art on them. And um, they're great, you know. While I, I prefer the original key art whenever I whenever I can get it, I mean, I think that's the the. But when the design, I mean, everybody thinks they have to make it new. The problem is the people that are designing this stuff now. A lot of them have not seen or they're not familiar. Like Poltergeist is forty years old, so you know, unless unless you saw Poltergeist or. I mean, it, to me, it's I, I forget. I think one of the biggest problems that I always have when I'm dealing with having these conversations is having lived through all of this, you know, and when these movies came out, they were events. Poltergeist opened on the same day as Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And it was like a for me, it was like, I, I mean, obviously, I was going to go see Star Trek first, but it was almost like a Sophie's choice. I'm like, how can I is there any way I could see both in the same day? And I probably could have, but I saw Star Trek II four times in opening day. I so I went so I didn't go to Poltergeist until the next day. But these were big event movies. And I had I would buy the one sheets, the movie posters, and have them on my wall and stuff for a long time. So those art were that artwork became something, you know, that I there's a whole different mindset about movie advertising. And um I I'll tell you guys, I don't I have an upcoming, I can't say who it is yet because I don't think it's confirmed, but I have a really interesting designing Hollywood interview that I'm really looking forward to doing. Uh, and one of the people I'm well, hopefully this person I'm going to talk to was instrumental in changing movie marketing for forever. And I don't necessarily know for the better. Um, but at the time it seemed to be very effective, but we'll see. I mean, why they wouldn't use that poltergeist stuff. I don't know. I mean that the, the, they're here artwork is so great, but if you don't, if you don't know what poltergeist is, like if you're, if you're, say you're a newly minted, you know, you're a student or you're, 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 you just came out of college and you're like in your, say you're in your mid to late twenties, you don't have any particular affinity for old artwork and you watch a movie for the first time, you have to design a poster for it. Not everybody's going to come down and think Carol Ann with her hands on the TV with the ad line, you know, they're here. That might not affect somebody the same way today as it did 40 years ago. And that's why people don't settle on that artwork and I, I i mean i get that but man that artwork on that poltergeist disc is terrible it's not iconic it's just so bad and then it's the way it's been retouched and everything it, it's not even a great from an artistic standpoint it's not even a great really a, 
you don't know what it is. Like you're looking at it going, oh, is someone's TV just too bright? <laughs> like, what, is it? How, what does that have to do with poltergeist? There's a poltergeist in your house because those the, there's a bright light on? I mean, I don't know. It's bad. Thank you so it's much, bad. Tom. Thank you, Tom. Hey, Rob, uh, any truth to the Picard has a son rumors in the in the new series? Is that something you can even uh, confirm or deny? Oh, I could not confirm or deny right. something like that. <laughs> I mean, you know, well, why would I know the answer to that question? All right, all right. <laughs> um, uh, although I do like that actor very much, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and and you know, wow, whoever he's playing in Star Trek. I think it's good casting. Okay. Uh, just wanted to mention uh, Ghost Writer uh, re-upped his membership. Just wanted to say thank you uh, for that. And oh, we've thank got you for that. And we've got a couple of super chats uh, from V. Glad to see you back and not just on the John. Heard they got a surprise episode of Strange New Worlds. Not all surprises are good. Wish they did so I could uh, hear you rant on it again. Great show. <laughs> There's a there's the comment there, um, so I don't know if there's any truth to uh, to there being a a bonus episode. We we did get a bonus episode of Sandman. Oh, don't know if there's one for Strange New Worlds. What's amazing about that bonus episode? First of all, that bonus episode of Sandman was the cat's pajamas. I mean, yeah. literally, it was so good. And so that takes what's really interesting about this. The now with that bonus episode eleven, we have the first eighteen issues of the comic. There's only 75 issues of Sandman. Then there's the Dream Hunters. There's the Sandman Overture graphic novel. There's uh, Endless Nights. So there's a few. But the actual run of the comic, I believe it's 75 issues and a special, maybe. Mm -hmm. So to, to now to now have 18 issues adapted of the comic and, and incredibly faithfully. Like I was always, I, I tweeted to Neil Gaiman, are you going to do Dream of a Thousand Cats? And he laughed. You know, he left. He goes, just wait and see. And uh, and I thought the adaptation of Calliope was fantastic. Yeah. And the fact that Erasmus Fry was played by Derek Jacobi. I mean, uh, I, Claudius, to me, is the godfather of television. Mm -hmm. I love I, Claudius. And to see Derek Jacobi. I mean, whenever Derek Jacobi shows up in anything, I'll watch it. Like, yeah. I love when, when you got the extended version of Gladiator. There's more Derek Jacobi in it. There's more, there's more Roman Senate intrigue, um, but yeah, I loved Calliope, and I loved seeing a dream of a thousand cats. I mean, I understand a lot of people said, you know, the fact that their mouths don't move, and I'm like, I, I didn't have a problem with that. So everybody was telling, if if their mouths moved, it would have been hella more expensive. That's how they should have done the cats movie in that style. Yeah. Oh my God, <laughs> that would have been, you know. And what's really interesting about that is they use the, the they use like oil paintings, mm -hmm. and they uh, it's really I thought that animation was quite beautiful. It yeah. was quite unique. Yeah, very very interesting. And then one last super chat comment here from Michael Brammer, who says I am concerned about NY MCU Street Heroes, uh, New York MCU. I enjoyed MM's appearance in uh, No Way Home. But Kingpin was utilized poorly. I liked Hawkeye until the final. It was like campy 60s Batman and did not care for Echo. Well, I mean, hopefully they'll get better in, in as the as they go along. I mean, it's funny. There's so much vitriol being thrown at She-Hulk. I really like She-Hulk. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really good. I mean, it, uh, it, was, it was what I wanted from it. And it, it was very sort of true to the spirit of the John Byrne sensational she-hulk run i mean i thought i liked it so you know hopefully like i don't know what they're gonna do with like i want to see mike uh, mike coulter mm -hmm. i have a man crush on mike coulter he's an evil now but i loved him as luke cage and i really hope that they bring back i mean mahershala ali obviously is now blade but i love jessica jones i i, I love i don't know if they're gonna bring back the punisher i'd like to see all those characters come back but not as kindler gentler characters yeah, I mean, if Disney doesn't have a problem airing the earlier seasons of Daredevil, why tone them down now, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, and they're on Disney Plus. They are. They are on Disney so, Plus. Yeah. So I don't understand. All right, Jeff Bingham, you should be able to unmute now. You are up next. Hello. What's so, up, dude? Uh, not much. Not much. Um, just the FYI, uh, kind of cutting it close. So if I don't make the full time frame. With what I want to talk about, I'm going to sign off. That's all right. Uh, 
So, um, did you, uh, so you remember on the John Campier show, I mentioned that I was uh, writing my first screenplay for fun? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I finished it. Congratulations. Yeah, it's crazy. How um, many pages is it? Uh, as it stands, uh, let me take a look. See, Just let me open this up. Uh, as it stands, it's currently at 113 pages. That's very respectable for a first screenplay. That's good. Congratulations on getting it done. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, I finished, I made it to the finish line last night. Um, I spent a couple of hours, um, earlier today uh doing like a first run through of revisions um nice. yeah and yeah like it was like which i i essentially finished about a half hour before getting the email notification for the uh saturday chat here so it's like got it done i came on here to wow think about it yeah so yeah wow yeah so what's it called um it's Called Entrapment, uh, no relation, not a remake of the Sean Connery Catherine Zeta. Yeah, no. but uh, do you want to guess the genre it is based on previous discussions that we had? Uh, uh, is it a horror comedy? No, <laughs> it's an erotic thriller. Oh, <laughs> nice. That's a, you know, I, I just read an article that said that HBO Max. That you know how they've they've gotten rid of they got rid of 200 Sesame Street episodes they, I read and I didn't know this that they got rid of a lot of their erotic late night erotic content a long time ago, really that they 86 it off the channel. Wow, I'm like, uh, why would you do that? Oh, I mean, I didn't know it was on there. I didn't really look for it, so to speak. Um, but yeah. Um, so I'm mean, at the moment. Uh, it's the only idea. Of, first screenplay that I've had um, uh, that I have sort of was able to sort of map out a story outline in my head for. Um, and that's essentially the reason why I wanted to do it for this one. Right. Well, that's cool. Congratulations on getting it. I know a lot of people in LA and the film business have talked about writing a screenplay that have never been able to finish one. Yeah. So congratulations. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, you know what? You should start do. you know, Obviously, I would say this to anybody, no screenplay right off the, the, the presses is the greatest thing in the world. But, you know, go through it, refine it, do what you want to it and get it to a place where you feel it's acceptable to show people and enter it in a few contests and see what happens. Yeah, I use the first uh, dr final draft writing software. And I think yep. they have like an annual competition. I might actually consider that. There's a um, lot of a lot of film festivals have screenplay competitions. I would suggest, um, you know, sending it to a bunch. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm at the point where, you know, I feel like I'm kind of like sort of done. It's just going to be like, you know, if I have downtime, uh, you know, I might just look through it, go through it just casually and see if I come across anything I can refine. Um, although I did sort of not quite take your advice in terms of waiting until I finish before doing revisions because I was sort of busy a few days last week, but I had some downtime. Um, and well, what I, uh, well, I mean, and what I did was I sort of just looked at it casually and, you know, looked through what I had done so far and saw things that I wanted to revise. Sure. Then. But the yeah. thing is you finished it. The reason, the reason that a lot of screenwriters get stuck. Yeah. They'll write the same 30 pages over and over and over and over and over again. And they don't, they don't push through to the end. And that's why I always suggest that at least get to the end of your script. So you have a finished piece. And then you go back and start the process of refining it. Yeah, because that's exactly what happened. Like uh, yesterday, I was like on the home stretch. And yeah, I yeah. did kind of get a feeling that I was kind of rushing through it. And uh, I guess rushing through, you know, lines of dialogue and whatnot, just to get to the end. And then, But yeah, and then I had the few hours, which for me, you know, because I like the reason why I... Um, refined it before finishing it during my downtime is because my experience writing is that, you know, doing revisions was, a, was far less time consuming than, you know, writing new pages. Cause you know, writing new pages for me, I was just so into it that I lost track of time. Right. Sure. Yeah. 
but congratulations. I mean, that's so cool that you finished it. Yeah. Morbidly curious says to what it's about or no? Or Look, if you want to tell us, you said it's an erotic thriller. Give us that law. <laughs> what's what's the log line? All right. So I know. All right. Well, here's the thing. In the past, I know I had railed against, you know, copycat movies, in particular, Fail Attraction. But um, this is it. It has the same premise of Bound by the Wachowskis, but it is more defined as an erotic thriller because I wrote more build up to the more build up of that desire and the attraction and the anticipation of characters acting on those feelings, so to speak. Mm. Well, so it's more like, like two chicks fall in love and commit crimes. Yeah, but more focusing on, well, falling in lust and then falling in love, but more emphasis on the falling in lust part of it. All right. Yeah, like the, because uh, the thing about Bound is that the, the it happens in the first 20 minutes. Right. Which I think is why people don't consider it a full-on erotic thriller. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've never considered Bound to be an erotic thriller because it to me it's more of a, it's just more of a thriller. I yeah, love it's, it's crime noir. Yeah, it's, it's a noir. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I totally. Yeah. I would. I would. I mean, usually an erotic thriller, the eroticism is as important to the movie as the thriller part of it. I I, I would hope that uh, you know. I mean, I would hope that I can would convey that if anyone were to read it. Um. Yeah. And 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 i guess the set and i guess I'll say the the setting of the movie instead of like money laundering for the mob in it involves cybercrime and corporate espionage oh that's cool all right i'm in <laughs> yeah and that's basically my uh basically because i have a business degree and also but i'm transition i transitioned over to cybersecurity oh, wow. oh nice yeah. yeah you'll never so, be out of work <laughs> I, I'm I'm not in the business thing anymore, but I still remember stuff from it. But it's kind of like me putting my own sort of knowledge of stuff into the scripts. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I don't know if I'm actually. I don't know how much more I'm if I'm ever. I, I'm still deciding whether I want to move forward doing something with the script, like you suggested, turning to a book or whatever. Um, yeah, I, get, I mean, I, get, I guess uh, I was it, just one wondering. A, uh, sorry. Well, it depends. It depends what you, yeah, what you would want to do. Like you said, you wrote a screenplay just for fun. But if it's a good story, why not? You know, whether you self-publish it or whether you turn it into a novel or whatever. There's always as an exercise. I mean, I'm a big proponent of anybody doing any kind of a creative exercise that you finish. You know, you've already finished the screenplay and, and leave it at that, but that's still a creative endeavor that you set out on, you, you embarked upon, and you completed. Yeah. I think it's, I think that's always worthwhile because you always, it help, if nothing else, it helps you focus your thoughts and critical thinking and putting out, creating a story of some kind is always helpful in, in terms of the way you think. Yeah. And I mean, and another thing is that, you know, even the, um, I kind of wrote the characters with certain people in mind, and that's kind of why I don't want to submit it anywhere, so to speak, because I, I have this obviously idealism that's obviously never going to happen of it being made with certain people. <laughs> well, <laughs> but that's right. just a fantasy. But that's just a, I understand that's just a fantasy. So yeah, but still, I mean, yeah. you should see. You, uh, you might as well get it down to where you want it, refine it to where you want it to be, and and uh, get the dialogue crackly and crisp. You know, a lot of. It, that's where a lot of screenplays, I mean, having, I read screenplays for literally for four years professionally and it was always the writing. And the thing is you could tell if a screenplay was worth reading, people would say, give it 10 pages. You could tell if it was worth reading in the, for, on the first page, you could just tell from the writing right. and, and, um, and it's, it's more of a, you know, it's, it's, and I've always said in a, quickly in a nutshell, the difference between good, good screenwriting and bad screenwriting is uh, even aside from the story and characters, but just the actual writing, great screenwriting paints a picture in your head. Like when you're reading it, you see it because of the words, 
So if 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 it's uh, if it says, you know, John walks into a bedroom. That's not good screenwriting. You know, you've got to tell me something about how John walks into the bedroom and what kind of a bedroom is it. You know, paint and and and, and while John John walks into a bedroom is a utilitarian line of dialogue, it doesn't it doesn't paint a picture for you. You know, it, it would be more like uh, John bounds into a bedroom or John walks with trepidation into a bedroom. You know, you've got to, you've got to give, you've got to paint that for the reader and, and the, the reader's the first person that's got to, they've got to see you have, your writing needs to conjure up images so people can see the movie that they're going to watch at some later date in their minds. And, and I'm like, if your writing does that, you're ahead of the game. Because so many screenwriters don't understand that. They don't get what what it means to do that. I mean, you, everyone thinks they do. But based on their writing, you can tell whether they really... And that's that, to me, is the first line of defense of great screenwriting. Is you, you need to paint those images with your words. Nothing should be generic. And people should never... People should never... The, your dialogue should never just be generic either. Hi... Hi, Emily. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? Don't ever do that. You know, friends or people, you know, you don't go, hey, how are you? You have something build character with how a character addresses somebody they know. Tell us something about that character by the way they speak. So nobody, no interesting character says, hi, Emily. I mean, or, or follow it up with something interesting. And don't say hi, Emily. Say Emily, yo, what's up? That's better than hi, Emily. You know, and you go from there. And a lot of people just don't know that. They don't understand that. And I'll tell you, uh, it's harsh. But of all the screenplays I read, one out of a hundred was worth passing along. It's bleak out there when you're trying to read spec screenplays. Bleak. There was nothing. It was such a soul-crushing, depressing job. Because on one hand. I would give people the benefit of the doubt. I would want their scripts to be good. And when you'd read them, you 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 knew within a page or two that they weren't going to be good, but you still had to read them because you had to write a synopsis and then notes. It was soul crushing. Yeah. Terrible. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, that's actually the work my daughter's doing in LA now, Rob, is uh, reading the scripts and... Uh, th does she tell you the horror stories? She tells me within a couple of pages, she can tell. It's not going to be uh, something she's going to be able to... Uh, to move forward but she has to do the synopsis just like you said so she's yeah you have to do you have to do the synopsis. It. you have to grind through it <laughs> and it's it's i mean it got to the point where in the 90s i was the development executive for this director and i there was a pile in the corner of scripts that i, I i'm like if this screenplay ends with some character shooting another character with a gun i'm tossing it in the corner <laughs> and the, the pile got really tall it just got really tall. And I'm like, I'm out of here, man. Hey, we've got a, a couple of more super chats to uh, call out. Uh, Cast Graphics says it's been a minute, uh, but I've been working Cast Graphics, hard. the official cheesemonger of this channel. The cheesemonger. I, it's been a minute, but I've been working hard. I'll send you a few extra treats and a package is coming your way. And by the way, She-Hulk is hot. LOL. Uh, you know what? I got to say, I really enjoyed She-Hulk a lot. There's a lot of people online that are bitching and moaning and complaining about it. I'm like, I, I really liked it. I thought it was good. Uh, I thought it was really entertaining. And um, uh, yeah, I really I really enjoyed it. Uh, but Kaz, Kaz, Kaz is a very talented graphic designer. Mm -hmm. so thanks, we've, Kaz. We've also got Mikey Lito, who gifted a membership. And the winner is Aaron Harvey. So I just wanted to say thank you to Mikey and... By the way, Mikey is know. the first person to gift somebody a membership on this channel. Well, From my, to my knowledge, that has never happened before. I didn't even know you could do that until a couple weeks ago. People started doing it on the John Campia show. Well, there we go. Aaron, yeah, that is, was cool. Aaron is now a member. Thanks to Mikey. Thank you so much, Mikey, and welcome, Aaron. And next up is Stubble McShay. You should Stubble, the man, the myth. Now. Bro, are you excited about House of the Dragon or what? Well, let's see. Uh, I, I was burned by the last last couple of seasons on uh, it's true, Game I think, of Thrones, yeah. but uh, so, I see what you did there. I was uh, burned yeah. by the last couple. Okay, <laughs> they they have to win me over, but uh, let's see what they what they got tomorrow night. Yeah, I'm excited. 
Yeah. Uh, your discussion on uh, uh, scripts and uh, rejecting after just a few pages and so on made me think of someone who, who asked what, why uh, they could reject uh, a, a book manuscript after just reading a page. And uh, they answered that, well, if you're in a concert hall and you can hear if it's a master piano player or if it's one who started trading three weeks ago. And it's more or less the same. It's an art to it. You have to practice to be really good. I totally agree. You know, and, and it, it's you, you hear that a lot. I mean, there is my one of my favorite things I ever read about the motion picture business is Josh Olson, who I'm Facebook friends with. It's It's been like 10 years. He wrote an essay for the Village Voice in New York called I Will Not Read Your Fucking Script. And he talks about how, you know, because he's an Academy Award nominated screenwriter. And I think the original post was taken down. But my favorite thing about that essay was not just the essay itself, but was all the answers, the responses. And it went about like 50 50. There were a lot of people going, well, you know, you somebody had to have read your script in the business and blah, 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 blah. blah and, and, and how did you get ahead if you're not going to read somebody's script? And he laid it out. The funny thing is, his essay lays everything out. And then, then he was taken to task in the in the in the comments but the comment section of that was so great because a lot of people had this sense of entitlement you know yeah. and 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 it's it you can you can tell you can yeah. tell i mean i hate to say that to people but and the funny thing is is you can read there's great screenplays all over the internet yeah you know you can download all... download your favorite movie screenplay and read it and that's always the exception sometimes they hit the jackpot for the first try and but in general, it takes a few tries to get it right. Yeah. And there there are some people that are just innately talented, you know, like yeah. anything else. They just have a, right out of the bat, they, for whatever reason, through os osmosis or just their education or whatever, they just know. Yeah. And if they just right. know, you know, they. I remember when, when Shane Black, uh, who's now obviously directed and, and he made Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, but he wrote like Lethal Weapon. He wrote The Long Kiss Goodnight. He wrote The Last Boy Scout. And he had a very unique way of writing that changed, actually changed screenwriting forever and that he would actually address the reader. He would talk to the reader of the screenplay, kind of like breaking that fourth wall. But his scripts were were just, I mean, he had the biggest spec sale. He was like, I think he sold the first million dollar script. And then then he sold more one point. I think the last Boy Scout sold for like one point seven five million. And then Joe Esterhouse sold the script to Basic Instinct for three million. And then I think Long Kiss Goodnight was four million or something. Wow. But yeah. when you read a when you read a it was funny because I was working at Warner Brothers when the Last Boy Scout came out and it was it was it was sent to the studios and everybody wanted to read it just because everybody talked about how much fun it was to read. And that's the kind of thing you want. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, just want to mention I got my third. Let the bound. Oh, nice. Uh, I missed the first time this went up, but uh, they re reissued it, Let the Bound. It's uh, the first Mistborn book by Sanderson. Nice. So I'm happy to collect those. Those are my hot toys. I don't spend money on the figures I buy. Books are probably better for you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the custom charge and, and the shipping cost just as much as the books. So whatever but uh you know you only live once so yeah uh, books are always expensive i mean that's one of the benefits of being an amazon prime member <laughs> yeah uh by the way uh, the road tripping you haven't done that in a while have you stopped doing that or no you know what? it's uh, yeah mike and i our schedules he was he just got really busy you know and, yeah. and and we couldn't do that anymore i mean it we'll probably get back to it again mike's prepping he's going to see his um his son and his daughter-in-law live in Kazakhstan and they, right. he teaches out there and he's going to go see their, their new baby uh, yeah. to visit in September. So I don't know when we'll get back to it, but. Um, I have su suggested what you can listen to while you have your road trips during the day. Uh, uh, this t-shirt, you see what uh, it says? Let's see. I'd have to hang on. What does it say? Music. Uh, oh, Monarch Securities. So. Uh, oh, is that is that Godzilla? 
No, it's not Godzilla. It's uh, Dressed on Pirates. Oh, oh, that's cool. So, I didn't uh, know they had a whole podcast. No, it's not a podcast. It's uh, it's Audio just the, the name of a security company in the in the books. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah the dress. Yeah. The thing is, yeah. when I when I listen, when I drive, if I'm not talking to Mike, I listen to like NPR news. Oh, uh, right. But, but but anyway, I will give my pitch for it here. Anyway, <laughs> so bear with me. If you take uh, Philip Marlowe, uh, the Raymond Chandler character, yeah, yeah, and you take uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and a bit of Clint Eastwood, and a bit of Merlin, right, and mix them, and then you dip them in uh, pop culture references, um, a bit of sarcasm, and uh, some other stuff. Uh, then you get a character that's, you know, hard-boiled detective in a magic world. So, uh, and it's a lot of sar sarcasm, a lot of, uh, he does stuff with the, with the, what do you call it? Mythology and folk folklore. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he makes the Billy, Billy Goat's gruff cool. <laughs> You're kidding. So <laughs> I love that idea. Uh, I, uh, I can go on and on and on. And uh, but anyway, that, that's my pitch. I, I think you you especially would like it. I think. Count me in. Yeah, I'm in. Uh, and then you know I sent you uh, a, a record a, a while ago. You it got misplaced in your in your uh, yeah. You I don't. I, I have the I have the shirt that you sent me. Yeah. Yeah, the, but, uh, but uh, in in your DMs, the last DM I sent you, I sent you just a track from that record, so you can just check that out to see what it was about. Oh, okay, I'll, and I'll yeah, I don't. Sometimes you know things have been. It might have uh, you sent to the new address, but I don't know. I don't know where it, it wound up because I got the, oh. the shirt's great. I was wearing it just the Elizabeth. Like, what is that shirt? And I go, Stubble sent it to me, yeah. and um, yeah, I I worked bed. I slept in that shirt. I love that shirt. But yeah, I don't know where that CD wound up, and that doesn't mean uh, there's so much stuff that there's we're still even going through. It'll it'll turn up. I guarantee you, it'll turn up at some point. Yeah, um, and um, then you know, I sent you a letter a few weeks ago. I don't know if you remember, but it was about AI in art. Yes, and I'm going to uh, read that probably today. I think I'm going to do a Rob observations later today because I want to promote. Uh, no, I think you. I think you already. Did read I read it. Oh, did I read it? Oh, okay. Yeah, but it was a follow-up on that uh, because there was an article on, I think it was NME or something like that, that Capitol Records had have signed. Uh, yeah, an AI I, rapper. Yeah, I saw that today. I saw a picture. I mean, that's so weird to me. Yeah, and I just wonder how long until there's a screenplay written by an AI. Oh, I, I, I'm. Already. How I does think the Academy Awards look upon that if they were yeah. able to? Well, there's the now those all the AI, people are going to these AI. Uh, last night, um, uh, on my Thursday, I have a Thursday night call with some friends of mine. Every a standing call Thursday night, and one of them, you can go to it on Discord. There's an AI art site, and yeah. you you just punch in a bunch of name, a bunch of things you want. The pro my problem with that is that it it is it is it's emulating other things that other people have already created as opposed to being something that's created spontaneously from intellect. I mean, the, the AI yeah. is, is, is it's a pastiche of a bunch of different things as opposed to being something that was inspired that came yeah. out of your own head. So the question is, is that a piece of art? Well, I mean, that's, I mean, you could say, I, I would say, you know, you've got to re, I mean, AI is the product of human endeavor. So yeah. if AI is going to start creating art or writing or storytelling, I, it's going to be interesting. I mean, it's going to be interesting to, I mean, we, I think that there's a lot of moral and ethical questions that we have not really come to terms with that. And I think that the next 
50 years are going to be all about that figuring out who we want to be as as people and we don't i don't think we we're, we're doing right now it's it's people's responses to things are either i love this or i hate this you know it's it's pretty binary where i think it needs to have a little bit more nuance but it's going to be the ai question is really interesting i mean when once ai writes the great american novel um uh, when that day comes it's going to be a really interesting debate or an ai writes an incredible screenplay does it matter if if ai if, if AI comes with a great story, does it matter that it's AI that created the story? I mean, from a moral, ethical, philosophical, more, mostly a philosophical standpoint, if AI can create something that is deemed great by the society at large, does it matter? Does it matter where it came from? Or does it matter where it came from? I don't know. Like, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, theoretically speaking, an AI eventually, if it if the singularity happens and it becomes self-aware, then it's a life form in a way. And how are we going to deal with that? Uh, I mean, we 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 can't even deal with medical ethics. <laughs> what are we going to do when we have to suddenly start dealing with artificial intelligence? It's going to drive people nuts. Thank so. you so much, Stubble. And coming up next, I'm going to have to let you say that name, Rob. It's Fernando. Fernando Barrero. <laughs> how are you, Fernando? How, more importantly, how's your mom? Uh, she's doing great. Thank you for asking. Uh, how are you, sir? I'm good. Have you guys gone to see any movies lately? Uh, not lately, but I, my, um, I had some medical, um, my my um my health has been up and down the last couple of weeks so i've oh, I'm been sorry uh, to hear that that's okay uh thank you um uh so i've been rewatching some uh some of my favorite movies like uh the other day i rewatched heat which is one of my favorites yes absolutely uh, i mean have did you now did you get the book heat 2 that came out last week no i want to get it though i do want to get, get it, it. okay got to get it i got the steel the steel book 4k so I want to get the book. Have you watched the Steel Book yet? The 4K? I have. Now, did you find the transfer to be too dark? I did. I did. I, and I read the con. I did find it not. It wasn't like overly dark, but I guess I did find it darker uh, than what than what I had previously seen. Yep. What about you? <sighs> you know, I'm really mixed on that transfer because clearly, okay. it, it. I believe it's too dark. It, you now, know, at, is, is at that first, the original vision? It was that his. It was that his original. Well, vision? here's the thing: both Michael Mann and right. uh, uh, William Friedkin have messed around with the. I mean, I can understand that the idea of something being darker. The thing is, Heat is a gorgeous film. It is, and I think there's a difference between something being too dark and and stylized. And I think that that. I think this transfer is too dark. I, I, I really do. And, you know, I watched, I watched twin flicks, did a really interesting analysis of the movie. Um, right. And, and it, it just, it, to me, it looks like when something is too dark, like when you're, when you're finishing something for home video, right. um, you, there, there, you have scopes, you know, you have specs that you have to follow and, uh, to me, it looks like it was, and people could say oh, it was creative intent, right. but it wasn't because the movie has never looked like that. It didn't look like that in the theater. Exactly. And so I, I, I do think seeing it in the theaters. Yeah, I do too. And I, I, I just, I'm like, it's too dark. And I think a lot of the time these, you know, I myself, if I ever get to put it on, 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 uh, on 4K, my own film, Free Enterprise, that I, you know, directed, I, I remastered it and did a, a new version of it where I recomposed the entire movie at 235 or 239 to 1 because okay. I wanted it to widescreen. And at first, and you can see the clips that I, they're on the they're on the Post Geek Singularity channel. And I did, I re-edited all of the, just the editing is very subtle, but I re-edited the, the film and I recomposed the movie and I was enamored of the, two three nine to one frame but after watching it i'm like you know what 
it's too much. I mean, the movie was shot in 185, and as much as I would like to have shot it widescreen, I didn't. So I could remaster it at two to one. Um, I don't like necessarily at 185. It, it looks fine, but it, it would look better, more cinematic with the. Sh- but, but you know, you look at it, and I lived with it for a while, and then I right. finally came to the conclusion: like if I had, if I had had the 4K, and I would have been like, I'm going to master it in two, three, nine to one. It's going to be widescreen, which really I'm cutting off the top and bottom of the frame, yeah. and then I recomposed a lot of it. Yeah, and I would I would have done it, and I would have regretted it. Yep. I would have regretted it. I agree. Uh, The other movie I watched uh, was um, uh, Hell or High Water. Oh, yeah. Had you Uh, seen it before? I had seen it before. Uh, I love that movie. loved the screenplay. Oh, Oh, so so well written. So good. I I watched it second time, and just the subtleties in the screenwriting, it was was terrific. Well, that's Taylor Sheridan. I mean, he's he's an incredible screenwriter. Yes. Yes, I, I love the way how you get a little bit of a, of a Western feel to it. Mm. Um, you it's know. totally a neo-Western. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and, uh, and Chris Pine and, um, and Ben Foster were, were, were amazing. You know? So good. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I meant to tell you also, I'm looking health, provide, health, health permitting, uh, I'm looking forward to being in uh, L.A. In, in a couple of weeks because I'm going to go see uh, John Williams at the uh, Hollywood. At the Bowl. Bowl. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. that you're yeah, gonna do that. so I'm looking, for, looking forward to that. So uh, hopefully we can. Uh, yeah, we should have we dinner. Can... Yes. I mean, I it, Pasadena used to be close. It was not okay. far away from. Now I'm about 80 minutes away, but it's just on the okay. freeway. It's no big deal. Gotcha. But if we could set up a time. Like, do you know where you're staying? Uh, I do. Um, it's, um, I know it's in LA. I don't have the, the address on me, but it's, it's in, it's in LA. Do you remember the name of the hotel at all or? Uh, no, it's an Airbnb. Oh, it's, oh, okay. Well, yeah, if, wherever it is, I mean, I could just come to you and I, we could go have a meal and, cool. uh, and, and, uh, go, you're going to love, you've never seen John Williams at the bowl. Uh, no, no, no. Um, uh, it's, it's all awesome. closest, the closest was when I saw. Uh, Star Wars in in concert was the closest. Oh no no! John Williams at the Bowl is incredible. It's oh, the whole incredible. the whole experience. The the Hollywood Bowl is a terrific venue. It's so much fun with everybody bringing their lightsabers and yeah. it's 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 really really great. And you, you, there's always some surprises. It's great. Plus, plus we don't know how much longer we're going to have him around. Right you know? right. I mean you know he said his Indiana Jones five scores is going to be his last. Yeah, he's 90, right? 90? Yeah, he's 90 years old. Amazing. Amazing. Um, yeah, and if he goes out with Indiana Jones 5, you know, what a career. Yes. I have to say, I've been working on this Kickstarter video. My friend Jeff Bond has written a thousand page book. Okay. Two volume book on Jerry Goldsmith. Right. And uh, it's going to be crowdfunded. It's inc- the book is incredible. What's it about? Jerry Goldsmith, the composer. Okay. okay. It's so good. It's yeah. so good. Is it? And um, the, the, uh, yeah, they're going to crowdfund the book. Okay. I think that it, the book sells for like 150 bucks. It's a beautiful two volume hardcover slipcase book. Looking forward it's to really it. It's really neat. Okay. Um, and I meant to ask you a question. Now, you're very high on Picard season three. Well, yes. Uh, other, now, now you haven't seen it, so what makes you so high on the season coming up? I mean, wait a minute, you. wait a minute, wait a minute. If you, I haven't yeah. seen it. Hmm. I don't know if that's entirely true. Oh, you have seen it. That's I don't know why. if I can. I I can neither confirm nor deny uh, I've seen or okay. read anything. Never mind. Okay. Uh, I, I can't. Okay. Um, I can't. Uh, I can't gotcha. confirm nor deny. Uh, I've seen Hell or High Water, which I have actually seen. But yeah. uh, let's just say for the time being. <laughs> Without, without that, that, that I know a great deal. Okay. About Picard season three. Gotcha. Okay. And and I I, could, I can give you an example of something that I've said. I don't I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. Right. Basically, uh, showrunner Terry Metalis, who worked for Brandon Braga on both Voyager and Enterprise, and yes. he was the showrunner, the co-showrunner, showrunner of. 12 Monkeys, the adaptation of the Terry Gilliam movie. Yes. 
He is the sole showrunner on Picard season three, which means he's not dealing with Akiva Goldsman. He's not dealing with uh, Alex Kurtzman and he's not dealing with Michael Chabon uh, on it. So he made this show that he wanted to make. Oh, okay. And it is, uh, he also got rid of uh, uh, a number of the cast of Picard seasons one and two. Really, the only returning cast member is Rafi. Okay. And um, so basically, it's a complete reimagining of what Picard season two and season one and season two are. And remember, I say this, take this with a grain of salt because I cannot mm-hmm. confirm nor deny <laughs> I've seen it's anything. Good. But just it's. Kidding. But it, yeah, it's a it's a complete reimagining, and I would say, imagine a fifth next generation movie, yes, spread out over ten hours. So oh, it's wow. it's okay. like a ten hour next generation movie, and it's very very different than Picard season one and season two. It's not right. full of ridiculous Good. gobbledygook that Good. makes no sense. Um, it, it is it is how can I say how should I how should I say this. Um, you know what? Here's all you need to know. Yes. Star Trek to the wrath of Khan starts with a title card yes. with a blue, a very specific blue font that says in the 23rd century, dot, dot, dot. Oh, really? Okay. Star Trek Picard season yeah. three starts yeah. with the exact same title card with the same nice. blue font that says nice. in the 25th century, yes. dot, dot, dot. I mean, maybe it does. Okay. Who knows <laughs> if I'm telling the truth, but, right. but, um, so immediately it tells you that this is set in the Star Trek universe that you know, that you want to see as Star Trek fans. Correct. And, and I, would, I would say that there's, it takes a lot of very familiar Star Trek elements and puts them together in a new way. But it was clearly, um, it was clearly somebody decided, you know, wouldn't it be great if we made an actual Star Trek show? As opposed to try and, I don't know, reinvent it, make it new, hip it up, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's, of course, you know, if uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that I've seen anything. But, you know, hang on a second. Thank, oh, you, so, thank you so much, Fernando. Gosh, I'm looking at something right now that I cannot confirm nor deny on my phone. <laughs> but it's certainly. Be, be, remember, Rob, we're streaming Pretty live. Cool. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> Who knows what I saw on my phone? One no man can say. Yep. Hey, uh, you said that Rafi is the only actor returning, but Seven of Nine is also returning. Correct? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I meant I meant of the yes, Seven yeah, yeah, of yeah. Nine is 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 returning. Okay. I just consider her part of the legacy cast. Sure. So. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's also somebody they, uh, uh, an actor, that they haven't announced yet, that is in the sh- in the show that I'm I, I can neither confirm nor deny how much I enjoyed their performance. But yeah. hey, to be to be honest, the one that I'm most curious for is how they're gonna deal with Brent Spiner this time around. So I'm I'm curious to see how that goes. Um, you never know. I don't know. You never know. I, again, I what don't want to get tell you. I, I don't want to get you in trouble, Rob. So. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I can neither confirm nor deny anything. anything. I, as a matter of fact, about about Brent Spiner. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, we know he's in it. He's is he? Well, it, it's on the on the cast list. I mean, on the on the trailer, it said Brent Spiner. It doesn't say who he's playing. It just says oh. Brent Spiner. So, yeah, we'll go. You never there. know. One one never knows. Well, maybe maybe Marcus knows. Marcus Bisma is coming up next. Marcus, you should be able to unmute now. Are you there, Marcus? Oh, so hey, up. Hey, hello, hello, Marcus. Hey. I like your uh, I like your uh, picture there. Oh yeah, it's my favorite movie of all, of all time. As so well, it should work. be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so, sorry, uh, Marcus. I just don't think <laughs> I can do that. I'm sorry. How are you? I'm good, Rob. So, Rob, uh, I want to ask you a question. So, I follow critics from the 90s, before the Rotten Tomatoes era. Oh, I, yeah, okay. I read a magazine, newspaper. The thing is, movie critic, at least in my country, it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a mainstream thing back then. Nobody right. that I know, no one that I know read movie critics. But right. after, the, after the Rotten Tomatoes era, movie critics are so mainstream. Like, 
90% of my friends and family uh, actually check the Rotten Tomatoes. But the thing is, they only check the scores. They right. never read. Maybe they read some sentence. They never read the uh, the full articles. So as a filmmaker, do the Rotten Tomato critics uh, scores? Uh, do you fear the scores? Um, I, I think people fear they from a business standpoint. Because Rotten Tomatoes scores, uh, people look, they just look at the scores. They don't necessarily read the reviews and they make judgments based on those scores, the aggregate scores. So it does matter. And if you don't get good Rotten Tomato scores, it can affect the, the business that a movie does when it opens. Because people look, unfortunately, I mean, you know, I grew up reading like Pauline Kael and, and, and Roger Ebert and, you know, even going back to Andre Bazin at, at Calle du Cinema, you know, when he was, I used to love reading like his books on cinema. And uh, I think people now we live in a society where people just read a, a look at those numbers and take them at face value. But the thing about it is, I would say this. I also think that the Rotten Tomato numbers are pretty accurate. I mean, as much as I'm loath to admit it, I think they're pretty accurate because, you know, movies are a populist art form and so if if you have normal people going and watching movies and they're and they're reviewing them or there are certain reviewers reviewing them those rotten tomato numbers are usually i mean i don't like it when people review bomb something like they'll go and just give something a bad review because i i mean i hate that people can do that but with rotten tomatoes you have to verifiably have seen the film so Mm -hmm. i kind of I, i mean i I, I don't like the fact that movies are reduced to a percentage, a number. I don't think that's fair to how hard it is to make a movie. But in terms of the overall impression that a movie has for the general public, I think it's pretty accurate. Do you do you trust the audience scores or the critic scores? I you know what? I hate I go usually by the audience scores more than I really do because audiences the people that are going see here's here's my problem with movie criticism now before like when i was growing up the people that were reviewing movies they knew about they knew about a lot of things like art history and they had a, they had they they knew uh, and 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 they, they were watching movies different kinds of movies a lot of foreign films people were watching italian neorealist cinema or french cinema You know, and so the people that were reviewing movies, especially in the bigger cities like New York, Chicago and Los Angeles, they really knew a lot about what they were reviewing. They weren't just somebody who liked movies and started telling you what they thought. These were, for the most part, the critics that I were reading were, were, were really educated people. But nowadays, film criticism, there's very little film criticism that's any good. Um, there are some people... Like uh, I like I watch Mark Kermode, um, you know, yeah, over on the B- BBC. I'm a huge Mark Kermode fan. I mean, he he really knows of what he speaks. Um, but it's unfortunate because there's 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 just not a lot of knowledge about film history anymore. Even the people that I really respect in in the YouTube space, a lot of them just don't have the they haven't seen a lot of these foreign films. And they haven't seen a lot of movies from from Hollywood history, so their 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 critical assessment of movies is fairly limited. But here's the thing: mm-hmm. audiences, the mass audience, you know, if they like something or don't like something, that's a pretty accurate assessment of of whether a movie's good or not. I mean, I really believe that if people like it, there's got to be because movies movies are made for the audiences; they're not made for the critics. And if people yeah. like, if people, if it has a big audience score, I mean, who would have thought, although I'd like to say I kind of thought, but I didn't think that in my wildest dreams that it would be this successful. Who would have thought Top Gun is going to be the number two movie in the United States this week? Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, now where are you, where are you, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Indonesia. So you're from Indonesia now. Yeah. Now, now, how do you feel about in Indonesia? Do you do you have film reviewers that you Indonesian film reviewers that you trust? Does do, do is there somebody who reviews uh, movies every week? Um, uh, I used to, but here's the thing, I I don't really 
uh, I don't really like the all the popular one are on YouTube's that they are the new generations. I come I used to the critics from the older generations yeah. and the older generation they are not really translate that well I get into YouTube space. Right. No, there are you're right, very few older critics. I mean there's not a lot of people that even now people think it's crazy that I'm even on YouTube and I'm like I've been on YouTube since 2015. And and it's uh, it's it's weird to think that but and I the first people I ever streamed with on YouTube were John Campia and John Schnepp. Oh yeah. So uh, I mean, what what do you think about the uh, YouTube critic, the big YouTube critics like Jeremy Jans, uh, Stuckman? I okay. I really like Chris Stuckman and Jeremy Jans, uh, and I think for the most part, I I, I respect them as reviewers as well. Um, I, I think they're good. Uh, and you know, Jeremy used to be a projectionist at a movie theater, and oh. um, you know, he used to show movies. And 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 Chris Stuckman, I think, is a really I like Chris Stuckman. I think he's fair and even even keeled. And I think, and I really like like the critical drinker. A lot of people, you know, his persona might rub rub them the wrong way, but I do think that for the most part, I really like his analysis of storytelling because he's a published author. So you know, he really he really knows his stuff. But you know, Mark Kermode, I watch. But yeah, I like I like Jeremy Johns and Chris Stuckman because I think they're I think they're very fair minded. I actually like your reviews of movies uh, because uh, I know your background and I know you watch uh, and you're a student of uh, movies history too, I guess. Yeah. And so I, I respect your opinion, even though I, I disagree. Uh, sometimes I disagree with your opinions of movies, but I, I still uh, value I would your... Hope. Uh, your <laughs> well, I mean, I appreciate that. I, you know, I don't... People have asked me to do more uh, review reviews and I used to. I used to like review mag I, when i wrote for this magazine i reviewed i reviewed movies but it's gotten to the point where I, this is sort of a, an arrogant thing to say but there's not a lot of movies that come out lately that i would even want to review and i, I what i mean by that is is again i'm looking for movies that have authorship and like when i see a david fincher movie i'm like oh my god that's amazing or a paul thomas anderson movie and all there are movies that i watch that i feel that are their art they have something to say but there's a lot of movies these days that i watch and i'm like i don't understand what am i supposed to take away from this movie they movies today a lot of them feel just very generic like it's a generic relationship movie um although there's been some really interesting horror movies that have been coming out lately that i find worth worth watching okay but i'd like to see i just like i'd like to see the art of cinema preserved and um, you know, I think there's a few directors that are doing that, but but so many movies now are so just generic. Yeah. So uh, one last thing, Rob. Um, I would like to recommend you uh, a podcast from Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery. Oh yeah. Great. Is yeah, it great? They, it's amazing. They talk about uh, Michael Mann the Keep movie, and they hate it. <laughs> in the last podcast, I think you should listen to it. It's, it's a great insight. Now, do they have an ongoing podcast? Just yes. Roger. A- oh. Yes, weekly video oh. archive, uh, video archive podcast. Weekly. Okay, I they saw that. I didn't. Movies. Oh, I didn't know if it was a one-off or. Oh, I'm totally going to listen to that. <laughs> is it just uh, audio or is it video too? Uh, um, so far, audio. Oh, okay. Wow, that's going to be worth listening to. All right. Okay, Rob. Uh, I gotta go. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for thanks for being on the yeah. chat today. Uh, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. And thanks for being a channel member. Oh yeah. Thank you so much, Marcus. Let me go ahead and uh, sorry, I, you were done a little bit earlier than expected, so I have to stop the timer right here. Um, and uh, Kelvin Wellborn is up next. Kelvin, you should be able to unmute now. Okay. Oh, yes, I am on mute. Yes. Hello. How's it um, going? Good, Rob. Actually, I've got a question. Is it Rob? Bob? Robert? What do you prefer? <laughs> Bob, I would think. I think you were Rob. Uh, well, it's it's funny. I When I grew up, I was Bob. I was Bob, Bobby. And when I moved to L.A., I made this conscious decision to just call myself. My real name is Robert. So, and by the way, I didn't, I never used, I never used my middle name. I started using my middle name professionally in the business because there was another 
Rob Burnett that was more successful than I was. So I used my middle name, but I don't, it's funny because everybody on YouTube calls me Robert Meyer Burnett. And I don't even call myself that. But so I started calling myself Robert when I moved to LA and, and went to USC and nobody would call me that. People just started calling me Rob and I was never Rob growing up. I was always Bob or Bobby. And, you know, um, I you. Yeah. So, so, but now I'm Rob or on YouTube, That's Robert Meyer Burnett. Everybody says his. Well, I, oh, I like R and B. I really like R and B is good. I like that. <laughs> anyway, um, I have a couple of questions. One, yes, sir. I, I did send this to you a long time ago, but I don't know whether you ever received it. I'm... I did not receive that. Um, Postal system. I don't know why I didn't receive that. Where did you send it? Wait, let me ask you this. Did you send it to my PO box? Send it to the one that's on the post peak simulator. Yes. And... Okay. I'll bet Mike has it for me. So Mike sends me, and I have a box to open. Like every, so all the things that get sent to me, I open them up about once every three months, all at one okay. time. Okay. So it might be in there. How long did you send it, it to me? It'd be about three months ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he'll probably Eight send it to something me. like that. Yep, yep. Is that the is that the set from um, Imprint? Imprint, yes, it is. Dude, you're the fucking man. Can I just say that? You're the man. That's right. <laughs> Ongoing reading that um, you know you're getting now four K transfers of these films um, like uh, War of the Worlds from Paramount. Oh, you know, I cannot. You know they, they, that 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 four K version's been available on on iTunes, but it's never been out on physical media. I can't wait to get that disc. I have to. But I mean, it, but Imprint put out it's kind of a bummer because Imprint put out. Uh, not only War of the Worlds, but they put out When Worlds Collide, too, which I have. That's right. And, and uh, it, you know, it's, it's the old double dipping. But situation. I don't mind. I mean, Imprint, I, I, I look down here. Imprint put this. This. I mean, I know this is coming out in 4K, but Imprint put this out. Yeah, I've and, got that uh, bad boy out there, too. Oh, Excellent. man. Do I, do I love this movie? And I love this box. I've got, I the, I got the, old, the old one ready to see. Out yep, I, that's what I, heave ho. It's out. It's out of there. Getting getting the theatrical version. I haven't even put this on yet. I need to put this on. I can't Actually, wait. That, that's the that's the latest one that I bought a couple of weeks ago. Oh man, I, and I I love that movie. Kevin Reynolds, The Beast. I love that. I gotta get that. I haven't that. seen it since it was released. I reckon. Yeah, me me neither. But it was funny though because um, I was I was thinking after sixteen years of owning Raging Bull. I thought I would actually get around to watching it, only to find that this is actually a non-animorphic release. Uh, yuck. Another one for the people. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, one of the things about, I, I feel like, I, I honestly feel that my my collection of discs, like I look at, I go to Bill Hunt's house. When I went to Bill Hunt's house to watch For All Mankind, the last three episodes at once before they dropped, you know, he's got like 20,000 discs and Drew McWeeny has like 25,000 movies or something. And I, I'm just like, I could never, I, I probably have 3,000 discs, I guess. And um, I keep replacing things like when they put new stuff out, like getting those 4Ks from Criterion, like the red shoes. I mean, I've owned the red shoes on Laserdisc, on DVD, Blu-ray. <laughs> and when I get something on 4K, I feel that that's the end. Like 4K yes. discs are the end. And when I put something away in 4K, I'm like, oh, but that's you know, over. You, know, never you, may never, you may never get something like this, though, in 4K. I mean, this is the best I've ever seen. Well, I can't movie. see. What, what? It's called The Seventh Curse. Oh, I have not seen that. It's Chow Yo Fa. Oh. Maggie Chung. Um, I'm in. Is that, did you get that from 88 Films or something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean they're doing the they're doing the Lord's. We might not get those things on a lot of those Hong Kong movies. We might not ever get on 4K, but if we can get them on Blu-ray, oh, and on the, 88 Films is doing a phenomenal job putting stuff out, I and so have. is Arrow. I mean that second Shaw Brothers set's coming out, the box set. I mean they, but uh, yeah, 88 Films too, and One One Films, and all these boutique labels. Uh, I mean the Lord's work. 
they are doing. They're putting all this stuff out. It's so great. I mean, I love seeing what we're getting. And I um, just want to give you a, a little criticism of this movie <laughs> by some guy named Robert Meyer. He, he just won credit. Hey, but you know what? That Blu ray is chock full of special features. I know. I've got to find time. You, the movie's um, like 83 minutes, but there's like eight hours of special features on that disc. Actually, I felt like this film should have been about five minutes longer. I agree. Uh, at, it at was, the by the way. It was. The film oh, really? The film was a lot, actually, it was a little different. Um, when I showed that to my studio executive, she came out of the theater and she said, the studio will never release this movie. This movie is the most offensive movie I've ever seen in my life. And uh, it will never see the light of day. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. So we worked with her. We worked with the studio. And we had to cut some scenes out. And to be fair, the movie was hideously violent. There are scenes in there that... Actually, there are scenes that are not in there anymore that were so far beyond the pale. Like, when we were making it, we're like... <laughs> but when you saw it in context... It was, I mean, if if the movie was the movie that we finished, it would be notorious. Oh, uh, yeah. A video nasty. It, it was a, it was an extreme because, and most of it involved really ugly and offensive sexual violence. It was way beyond the pale. And when you were filming <laughs> it, when, when we were filming it, it was, a, when you're making a horror movie, it's hilarious. I mean, you, yeah. you're just giddy, like, you know, bring on more blood, more depravity, more. And then when you actually watch it back in context, it can be really rough. And then you, you realize that if we had made this movie, if the movie was released the way we finished it originally, somebody, you know, some 15 year old girl who loves horror would have taken it home and watched it, been traumatized. And her mother would have come screaming back to Walmart saying, what is this horrible day? You can my daughter watch this. And then we would have, I mean, and, and in a way, it was funny because they would have fired us and and had somebody else finish the movie, but they they were they let us they let Dave and I stay on and That's consult. Cool. Yeah. Tom Jr. Jackson says they call her one eye is perfectly paired with the last unicorn. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Tom, you should be ashamed. Ashamed of yourself. But yeah, but but hey, the movie, it should have been longer. I mean, I'm proud of it. I, I still think it, it, it it's a fun little movie. Um, it was fun to make. We shot the entire thing in Bulgaria. Um, that was the so, only other main criticism I have is that you can tell it's Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah. it's just the way, I don't know how it is for you, but sometimes you can just tell what's in a movie. Well, it, I'll and tell you. It doesn't feel like the place it's supposed to be in. There is, there is nothing in Bulgaria that looks like the United States. <laughs> nothing. Like, it's really funny. If you, if you watch the movie, there's a, they go to a gas station right in the movie everything because the, the language is it's it's a it's russian and it, the the alphabet yeah, is cyrillic i mean yeah. actually the russian language comes from bulgarian and at, so the gas station we had to de redesign everything and then our art department was bulgarian so oh, yeah. even though they're they're putting things in english it doesn't look like what you would see in an american gas station so yeah. Yes. It's like, you know, any supposed US city, but you know it's filmed in Vancouver. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is you can't you have to either use stock footage because nothing looks the same. The cars don't look the same, the buildings don't look the same, the roads don't look the same. So like they go to a they go to a a movie theater in the beginning. The characters are going to this movie theater. That movie theater looked nothing like an American <laughs> movie theater. And we kind of had to make it look like it was in America. It they didn't work. I mean, it worked as much as we could. But even in the even the furniture in the in the guy's apartment, it you know it doesn't look like it doesn't look like a real. <laughs> just, nice. There's nothing you can do. We tried. <laughs> Thank you so much, but Kelvin. Th thanks for getting the disc, though. <laughs> Hey, uh, Rob, a couple of more Super Chats here. Oh, actually, Holy Hand Grenades has become a member. So just thank you oh. to Holy Hand Grenades <clears throat> for becoming a member. 
Yeah, come on and in the chat, man. Ten dollar super chat from some old guy in Hawaii. The Beast K Reynolds is awesome. Does that mean that you have also seen Fandango? Oh yeah, I, oh, I and I own Fandango. Thanks to Warner Archive, they put out Fandango. Uh, they put out they put out Fandango and something else. And I oh they put out that in American Flyers, the Kevin Costner bike racing movie. Got it. And uh, I love Fandango. Huge fan of Fandango. Right. I like Kevin Reynolds, man. Yeah. We got Justin Toner coming up. Justin, you should be able to unmute. Uh, I'm good. Hello, sir. Hey, Rob. How you been? I've been good. How have you been? You've been buying stuff. Yeah, doing okay. Dealing with a little uh, infection in the eye, a little conjunctivitis last couple of days, but it's getting better. Oh, so. that's good. I've had that before. It's not fun, but. That's why I was got the cloth on my eye earlier. <laughs> yeah, I've been buying stuff. I mean, it's like just uh, wish I could buy more. Just you know, it's like I don't have the budget to buy everything I want. It's like, I know, <laughs> and there's more. You know, it's funny. It ebbs and flows. For a while, yeah. there was nothing, and then stuff comes out, and you want it. Yeah, like it's... last month with the Criterion sale, it was just like it was like well, I was like, well, it's like I had to get Raging Bull. Yeah, and th that's 4K. the new 4K. Yeah, that's and what sucks is what I can't stand about that is like with the Criterion sales, I, it's gotten to the point where I have almost all the Criterion discs I want, and now they've started putting stuff out in 4K. I'm like, damn it, you froze, Justin. You have frozen. Just yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, it's you're like, back. Uh, you're and my frozen. internet's acting up a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'll try to be as quick as possible, so in case I have more problems. So as I got the shaft, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. I got I got the thief. I know that it's like you you prefer the other release, but it's like I wanted to get at least to see the movie. Well, the thief. I love thief. The thing about that version of thief is it's the longer director's cut. It's only got a few yeah. extra scenes. I I don't. I love that for. I, I love thief. Thief's one of my okay. favorite movies of all time. I love and of that. Of course, movie. the the crown jewel of that month was Double Indemnity and Four Days. The Star Wars, the Star Wars of uh, film noir. That mm -hmm. disc looks incredible. I haven't gotten to watch it yet. I heard it's great. It's they did, incredible. They did yeah, they, it's, it's... Criterion's crushing it, man. It's like, ever since they started with the 4K with Citizen Kane, man, it's like, they've been killing it. And and uh, we got, they like, they're doing Malcolm X coming up and uh, Night of Living Dead in 4K. Night of Living Dead in 4K. And, and, I mean, they're putting out that three-disc, well, the three-movie Infernal Affairs set yeah i've always wanted to see those movies so i'm looking forward to get oh that. the the first infernal affairs is really really good yeah uh, of course the departed forward. the movie the departed is a remake of infernal affairs. And a couple others like uh i finally got the blade runner because it's blade runner and uh casino oh, oh. i haven't watched casino in a long time and this was like i only got this for like 10 bucks on amazon dude on sale. the first hour of casino is one of my favorite first hours of a movie it, and that's the four. You got the four K. That's four K. Yeah, it's the four K one. It looks beautiful. Good. It is a yeah. stunning, stunning. And it just uh, just a few weeks uh, more Star Trek four K. Uh, I've yep. been holding off buying stuff um, as much as I'd like to get like the Shaw Brothers box sets and stuff like that, and or Heat in four K. Even though it's like with what people have been saying, um, I was like, no, I'm gonna wait, and uh, it's like I, I need to get five six and uh motion picture director's edition four oh, yeah. case yeah I, I can't wait to get that box set too uh i'm so happy that they're putting the director's cut of six that that hasn't been available since like dvd days yeah they it, did it, yeah no it hasn't it was on laserdisc and dvd and you know it, it's funny the director's cut of star trek six really changes the movie Oh, it does. Yeah, it makes it, I think it's even, it's better. With the, yeah, it's you know, better. I mean, you got the whole conspiracy angle, although Rene Ar Yeah, Ar yeah there's more, yeah, with the Rene Arjavaz characters restored, yeah. and he was part of the conspiracy. Yeah, uh, and I loved all that. And Nanclus yeah. is part of it, too, you know, the Romulan ambassador. Mm -hmm. Because that's, I thought that was cool. I mean, Star Trek Six. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with. I think some of it's, like, a little cheesy, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's one yeah. of my favorites. It is. The I score is look, great. It's got great scenes in it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to have those in 4K. And um, then I'm going to give my extra Blu-rays to a friend of mine who's a, a Trek fan who doesn't have any, really any of the Trek movies on Blu-ray. So I'm like, I'm going to give you my old Blu-rays 
<laughs> once they get the 4 case because the 4 yeah, case yeah. have both working blue. So, like, these are going to be extras you can have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Can't Thanks. wait. Uh, wait. My friend and I, I've been watching the Orville season four with uh, some friends of mine, and we've been in, really enjoying that. Oh, it's the last season has been great. There's a lot of great episodes. We're, we're going to be watching the final episode this coming week. We're, 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 we're going to be finishing oh, nice. out the season. I mean, that Kalon episode was epic. Oh, it was. That's the one we just watched this past week. It was a. Uh, they they really saved up the budget because those 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 action sequences were so. Oh my else. god! Incredible. Unbelievable. In the writing, it's like uh, it's just this this is like the best season for the show. Uh, yeah, it's by by far. I hope it gets yeah. renewed. I really hope. I'll be disappointed if after, with the with the quality of the season has been. I'll be really disappointed if they don't get it renewed. I just don't know if it will because of how expensive it is. You know, really yeah, depends the thing. what Disney like, wants is, to is, do. Is, is Disney slash Fox willing to keep giving them the budget? Yeah. Uh, but after that, we're going to dive into Strange New Worlds. Um, I, it's like I wanted to finish watching it. Um, uh, I like it's like because, um, you know, it's like a lot of people have enjoyed it. And, you know, others have, it, you know, like liked some of it or didn't like some of it. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like. Like like you, you it's like you mentioned that you know it's like there was things you liked and, and the other things that you were like didn't care for, so yeah. I'm looking forward to giving it a shot because people who hated some uh, at least uh, one friend of mine who hated Picard season two like you did, he really enjoyed Stranger Worlds. Yeah, I mean it's it like, feels more thought, like he thought Picard season two was garbage. I don't know how he finished watching because I couldn't finish watching. It. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean I understand why. Look, Strange New Worlds to me it would if nothing else it skates by on. Anson Mount's charisma and good looks. I yeah. I would just watch. I would just watch him. I I watch him wander around shopping. <laughs> you know, whatever. His, what he's, he's done just, with Pike, he's put Pike like like way up the ladder for me as far as like my favorite Trek captains because like Kirk and Picard are like at right at the top for me, and like he's kind of like closing in. It's like uh, it's like uh, I still put Cisco ahead of him, but it's like. I will at least, um, he's like top five now for me as far as like, See, I just don't feel that there's anything else going on on that show. I, I mean, the rest of his crew, they're fine. The actors are fine. Yeah. But I, I don't feel, I don't, be, you know what it is? I don't believe Strange New Worlds. I mm-hmm. don't believe the set design. I don't believe the visual effects. I don't believe. They pump so the, much money to us, what shocks me. It's like, I don't it, believe the crew don't quarters. Need to go that high. I mean, you want good pro- quality production, but it seems like it's like um, they've gone a little bit over. It's like because I felt that on Discovery at times, where I'm like, it's like, it's like, look, you want to update things, it's fine, but at least make it look at least a little bit closer to like original series. Well, it it, so, it all looks like a Vegas show. It looks yeah. to me like I'm looking at something that's meant to be on a stage, and I yeah. feel like everybody should have roller skates skating <laughs> around those sets because the the floors are all these shiny. You, you would not make a, a, an environment like that if you had to work. Like, I felt the same way about Star Trek 09. There's mm-hmm. all these lights. Like, if you're in a ship and you have to organize controls and see what you're doing, it would not be brightly lit like that. Yeah. You know, with, with lights shining shining into your eye lines. And it, I watch this. I'm like, I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy mm-hmm. that this is actually designed by somebody who thought. You know, what's interesting, yeah. when, the, when Star Trek The Motion Picture came out, and you, there was the cross section of the Enterprise and all that. It, they always went for function, form and function, and yeah. they consulted with people like, oh, I don't know, in the military. And yeah. and so it, I, I just don't. I, I, that's my problem with everything about Strange New Worlds. Mm-hmm. It, I don't believe it. I don't believe the okay. command structure. I don't believe the way people talk to each other. I don't believe that Pike would talk to his subordinates the way he talks yeah. to them. I don't. I don't buy. I don't buy. I look one. forward to. Giving it a giving it an honest try because uh, it's like um it's like I, I, mean, a lot, I understand a lot of watchable a ever. lot of people like it you know but oh. I'll tell you something for all mankind and the expanse are far more to me far more interesting yeah, yeah. but with what you said about Picard season three really gives me hope so fingers crossed uh, it's like uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm keeping that uh, hush hush because like I don't want to get you in trouble either <laughs> it's like I don't want to say like well I've heard the Picard season three is gonna kick ass. Like, where did you hear that? Well, I mean, I can, I, I think I can honestly say, you know, knowing what I know, it, it feels, if nothing else, Picard season three feels like you're watching Star Trek. Yeah, that's, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what I want to hear. So, I mean, it's right. a, yeah. Oh, uh, I, I had to get, 
I uh, got given up enough time here. Uh, um, so thanks, Rob. Uh, we'll catch you later. We'll get, um, no, fi- no, uh, no physical media tomorrow. You said no physical media tomorrow because I okay. cannot confirm or deny what I'm doing. Okay. Well, <laughs> I hope you whatever you I can't confirm or deny, you you have a good time tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Justin. Let me see who. Oh, a couple of things. We did have a PGS hero who uh, is saying uh, hello, Rob. How was it work? This is uh, sorry, Wesley Nimella. Oh yeah. Uh, and he posted uh, hello, Rob. Uh, how was it working with all of the cast and crew on Agent Cody Banks? Any good stories from the set, Rob? You are the man. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that that. The making of Agent Cody Banks turned out to be the worst experience professionally of my entire life. Uh, it involved my one of my partners turning on us, lawsuits, losing the. It was it was just a horrible experience all the way around, and um, I'm and even the movie. So my friend Zach Miller, uh, uh, pardon me, Ashley Edward Miller, and Zach Stentz, Ashley Miller created dota dragon's blood but zach and ashley wrote so we found this we bought i had a company and we bought the screen option the screenplay from a limo driver and the idea was and then zach and ashley rewrote that script and the idea was ferris bueller meets james bond and um then when i won't get it it's such a long story right but eventually we got the we got the script sold to mgm great right i mean and from the time we sold the script to mgm in february they wanted to start shooting the movie in may may of 2002 and this like 20 years ago oh my god and this like this is this like never happens this quickly but then what the studio decided was that they wanted to turn this film into a tween movie for 8 to 12 year olds so they took this pretty epic james bond-esque movie and made it for eight to 12 year olds, you know, and not to say that Frankie Munez and Hillary Duff weren't great. Cause they were, you know, Dan Roebuck. And there's, a, there's the cast is actually pretty great, but the tone of the movie, what we were going for was more of a back to the future. Imagine a back to the future tone, but a James Bond bent to it. And they made everything. They kidified it all. They went more with like a spy kids bent. Yes. Yeah. And that's what, that's what the thought was. Mm-hmm. And and the movie did okay, mm-hmm. you know. It cost like twenty twenty four million, and it made fifty five or something. It would have made if they'd gone with our version of the movie. It would have made two hundred million dollars. Wow! But that's that's what happens, you know. You you you, and then the the second movie that I have absolutely nothing. I'm a, I'm a producer on that film. It's funny because if you look at Agent Cody Banks, Madonna was a fellow producer on that with me. Wow. Um, Jason Alexander was a fellow producer on that with me. But if you watch the main the main titles, which happen at the end of the movie, I'm still the only person, oh, the only producer, I'm a co-producer, but I'm the only producer that has what's called a single card credit, meaning my, my, my name, it's big, it's big in the opening of a movie to get a single, meaning, meaning you get your name on the screen with no one else's. And even Madonna shares her credit. Wow. I'm the only single card credited producer because you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. You get what you negotiate. That's right. And uh, while everyone else was bitching and moaning, complaining, I negotiated myself the co-producer credit with a single card. And if you watch the credits at the end of the movie, they're hilarious because my name is just (laughs) hilarious. Well, here's uh, here's Kevin, who's been waiting patiently here. Kevin, you should be able to unmute now. Hey, Rob. Hello, sir. I like the Casino Royale poster behind you. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, question. Or actually, that's um, a Quantum of Solace poster, yeah, that, isn't it? No, that's a Casino Royale. Is it, oh, it is, okay. Yeah, it's Casino Royale. Um, I was, I'm starting to kind of get physical media. I don't have a lot, but um, I'm starting to notice. I, I don't have a lot of, I, I don't subscribe to a lot of the streaming services like Paramount Plus, Apple. Sure. So I'm, I'm finding that there's older movies that I can't watch. So yep. the best way to do is just get those. And then I'm, I noticed like um, Blazing Saddles is on uh, Hulu right now. And I, I, I haven't watched it yet because like, I, I want to see, but I want to watch, see how much they've taken out. Because I, I, I don't think, 
I don't think they've taken out anything. Really? Okay. Because because I've been hearing a lot of hullabaloo on mm-hmm. uh, on uh, social media about people watching it and they love it, but they can't believe what's in that movie. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to see that because I still I do have that. So I want to see if there's anything taken out. But uh, that's what I am worried about with certain things. Is oh, and especially start things out, especially that movie. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it is decidedly Absolutely. not woke. <laughs> <laughs> I. It's just, yeah, I just find it interesting. But I, I think what people are realizing is that, okay, you know, some of the, it's, it, it, it it's funny. Yeah. I mean, it's funny the, the, I, the, that we do not have the ability to laugh at our own shortcomings or whatever. I, I'm, I'll be and, the first one to make fun of myself. I don't care. That, well, you know, I mean, I don't care. It's people not can, like I, if you go back through human history, we, we don't exactly have a spotless track record. No. No, um, but in terms of um, like Blu-rays, um, if I'm looking at something that say re- was released in 2012, mm. and then there's another Blu-ray that came out, same movie, say in 2016, is there anything that's different with the actual quality of those Blu-rays, or is it more or less just what the content that's on it? No, sometimes it well, it's both. Okay, I, I always look because um, the thing about transfer technology is it's it's really gotten a lot better. Mm-hmm. And so, um, usually the later transfers are better. So, you know, oh, is that safe to say? Then always try to go for the the newest one you can get. Not, not always. All the okay. So, so there is a website. There's a website called DVD Beaver. DVD Beaver. DVD Beaver and DVD Beaver does comparisons of each version of a movie that's been released, and it gives you bit rates. And it'll show you the differences between them. It's a really great resource. And it does Blu-rays also. Oh yeah, yeah. I see it. okay. Blu- Blu-rays and 4Ks. They really go in depth. Okay. So uh, DVD Beaver. Okay. I uh, see it. And and uh, it's definitely something to to. Um, and then you know if you go to Blu-ray.com, mm-hmm. sometimes they've got they've got actually not sometimes they've got great reviews. Okay. And I, I usually go to DVD Beaver or the Digital Bits or um, Blu-ray.com. You know, those are the places, my go-to sites. Okay. Because I'm starting to kind of go back to older, some older films and stuff just to watch and trying to get my son to watch some of them. Some, some he will and some he's like, nah, dude, that ain't working. <laughs> so. It's really interesting. Like, like uh, the idea... Like when I was a kid, there was nobody who would ever say they no to a movie. Mm-hmm. Like you know, we'd watch anything. He's a sixteen-year-old boy, so some of this stuff, if it doesn't yeah. catch, if it doesn't catch his fancy right away, man, he's he ain't watching it. Well, so. yeah, I mean, we were all kind of movie fanatics when we were kids, you know. So, it, yeah. but I, I know, man, it's really tough. We, we it, you know, it's it's weird because um, I've really, I've said this before, I've really taken to your show and some of these things, but I, I've never been into films and stuff as much as right now i've always been an athlete my son's an athlete that's all we do and so this is all kind of new to me that's why i asked some questions people are like looking at me going you should know this stuff if you're into this kind of thing but (laughs) no i've I've always no it this is all kind of new to like and and i was going to say i that's why i took to your channel and i enjoy like critical drinker because the way you guys look at movies i like how you guys analyze movies like the writing the editing, uh, does the movie make sense? Does it flow? If it's an IP, does one story move to the next? Yeah. You know, does it all make sense? And I think some other people, they're they're like like John, he's he's okay to watch, but I don't think he looks at movies the same way. Right. And he just it's like, oh, it's good or not good. But then you look at it and you look at it more critically. And and some may say, well, ah, he looks at it more intellectually. Well, yeah, but it, it's it makes it interesting to listen to well you. i appreciate that you know yeah. and I, I love hearing that you know you weren't you're saying you're you're you weren't that into movies but now you're you're going and doing the research i mean i think yeah. what's really what's really interesting about film is most people just put on a movie and watch it for 90 minutes or two hours and they're done with it mm-hmm. but the act of movie making is so fascinating and it's so interesting and when you look at the many phases how it the thing I love about movies is they begin on a page. You know, they begin begin as a literary exercise where you actually have a screenplay that's written. And then you have this 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 outline and that's pr- really what a screenplay is. Call it an outline, call it a blueprint. Then you have to like visualize it. 
you know, and, and when you think about it in terms of, okay, you, you, you've got a screenplay and say there's a, a scene where, where three people meet in a restaurant and talk at a table, just a fairly simple scene. How do you visualize that? Right. Like where, where do you put the camera? Yeah. Where do you put the lights? What kind of a restaurant is it? How many other people are there? Is it a big restaurant? Is it a small restaurant? So there's a million different decisions that go into every shot in the film. Yeah. And I find the whole thing fascinating because you've got a whole team of people that come together from these disparate, you know, in a way, it's kind of like a talk about a sporting event, like a team, mm -hmm. you know, a football, yeah. a football team, for instance, you have within a football team, there's different disciplines. I mean, sure, everybody has to catch and run and tackle, but still there are people that have to understand, like, what if you're playing in the backfield, you know, right. what if so and everybody's everyone's essential, you know, you yeah. can't get rid of a position. And then that's I, I like when I say I wasn't a fan or not a fan of movies, I've always enjoyed movies, but I sure. never really thought about the background. And then that's kind of what got me into what I want to be an animator, because then when I was a kid or even later, I was like, I didn't even, I didn't know how much work kind of went into that stuff. And then it's like, oh, crap, right about Pixar. It was like, oh, OK, you can actually make money doing this and get a job and you can actually enjoy doing what you know you want to do and then that, that's yep. when i started doing stuff it's like oh okay this is cool but no, i was gonna I... say real quick too um before we run out of time is i've actually really enjoyed sandman a lot i know a lot of people have and my wife loves it too we i think we're on number seven or eight we're not quite done but i didn't think she would like it um and i and i think we i like it a lot because i don't have a lot of background with that comic i never read right. that comic and so some of the things that I heard before, some of the changes and stuff, um, I, it didn't make any difference to me. I didn't know. But one of the things I read, maybe why I don't have a problem, is because I think I heard that Neil Gaiman actually had some input into this. Oh, he's producing the show. So, yeah, to yeah. me, I was like, okay, if the creator doesn't care about the changes, then so what? So well, I you know, a lot of it, a lot of, because there there's race and gender swapping in the so show. What? Well, this is the thing. It, it's the one place where it really doesn't matter oh. because like the, the endless are anthropomorphized right. versions. I mean, they're more, they're more entities than anything else. They don't really like they've taken in a way you have to think of them as they've taken human form. So we, mm -hmm. you could in a meta way, the Sandman is about the act of storytelling. Right. So the Sandman himself has taken the form where we can actually see him and experience his stories because we're human beings. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, any any in the universe, any sentient being that dreams goes into the dreaming. Right. And they don't look if they don't look like human beings, if it, you could if Sandman took place on the Predators homeworld and the Predators, I'm sure, dream because they go hunting, uh, then the Sandman would look like a predator. Right. <laughs> so the Sandman can look. You can choose any form you want. I've loved just the conversations. Oh, uh, and that's I think right it was out of the comics. Episode five, I think, with the, the gentleman that he kept meeting and then with death. The, yep. the whole show was just con conversing, and I loved it. I thought That's it was, episode six. Six, that okay. Death, yeah. I, I thought it was fantastic. I was oh, like, that's crazy. It was that, really those, good. Those two – Th those are based on two of my favorite issues of the comic. That was awesome. So the 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 uh, death that was actually uh, issue eight of the okay. comic, but it was yeah. they took that. It's almost the it's almost word for word. Oh, awesome! That that comic, and yeah. then same with the story of Hob Gadling, um, who's his friend. I mean, that was I uh, seeing that that episode of TV was wonderful. And if you yeah. like that episode of TV, you have the sensibility to like to love Sam. Like no, I didn't like. I don't know if you liked it or everybody just thought it was weird, but the diner one. Yeah, the diner. I, I thought that was to me, and maybe I'm just kind of I don't know. It would to me it was something for show, for people. Yeah. Just and I'm like I don't need to see that. The not the, not, and, and I don't mean well. I shouldn't say I, I don't want to. It's not that it. Some of it was just like it seemed like it was uh, the sexual part. Yeah, uh, they they toned like, it. The comic was a lot more brutal. Okay. And it was really really violent. And yeah, they I, sort of they sort of pulled back on that and went in a more uh, more sexual like it's funny cuz I don't think that that episode was as good as the comic book was. If that makes sense. And I think that they added they added more sexual content and downplayed the violence. 
And I can understand. I mean, I get that. Um, but, you know, what I love about the Sandman is, the, is it has so many different tones within every episode. But the Sandman, for the most part, is much more lyrical. And I think that that now when you see these different arcs, because episode seven through ten is one long story. And it's a little weird. But all these characters that you meet in that in that arc play play out later on in the Sandman storyline. And then the episode, the secret episode or the bonus episode they dropped this weekend is amazing. It's fan, the it's the dream of a thousand cats and Calliope. Uh, the the episode eleven, the first part of it is animated. So you'll get a kick out of it. Thank you so much, Kevin. Hey, Rob, one thing about Sandman that episode two, the one in the diner. That's also one of the problematic ones in that they were kind of more tied to the DC characters, correct? Yeah, if I remember the, correctly. Yeah, John D. They mm -hmm. call him the David Thewlis character in the original comic is Doctor Destiny, exactly. who's a Justice League villain. Yeah, and did it, what was I wrong with? But when I saw episode one of Sandman, they actually included some scenes from Sandman Overture as well. Uh, yes, I think the scene when the Corinthian visits. Uh, 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 the character played by a Charles Hand, yeah, um, that was from Overture. That wasn't from from the original run, if I that, remember correctly. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. They and and the whole thing about stringing the Corinthian through the first season was was yeah, they took that inspiration. But I like the fact that they did that mm -hmm. because it really gave it more of a sense of like this character escaped from the dreaming. Right. He's been running amok for a hundred years. And it's, you know, a, and it's a way to clearly explain what Dream needs to do about recapturing the dreams by just focusing kind of primarily in that one character. So yes. I, I thought it was a good way to do it. Yeah, I agree. And and, and again, that's adaptation. You know, you have to, it's, it's like people who read the book Jaws, they're like, wait a minute, Ellen Brody had an affair with Matt Hooper? And it's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> got rid of that. <laughs> All right, we got Shadow coming up. Shadow's been patiently waiting. You should be able to unmute now, Shadow. They beat me if I was blind, stinking Hello. sober. Hello yeah. there. Hi. Yep. Yep. How are you? Uh, new member, first time joining one of these. Well, uh, welcome, welcome to the chat, and thanks for being a member. Thanks. Um, I had super chatted you a week or two ago um, about the Black Panther, um, how it kind of the death of Chadwick Boseman. Oh yeah. Connected with me because it's a whole cancer. Um, just an update on that. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I go for my one year scan. So as long as that's clear, I'll have been clear for a year. Wow. Congratulations. Um, my pocketbook is uh, cursing you, though, because I uh, <laughs> I may have pre-ordered a few uh, hot toys. Uh, which ones? Um, well, I did a new computer desk setup, and I've got the... Um, dark knight uh secret labs chair right and i have the lego bust of the cows so uh batman and then that did you, did you order the dx the new dx dark yes. knight that yes. figure is incredible did so you get it yet no 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 i think it, that comes out next year oh oh that that figure is great yeah um and then i had artwork of from um, Neil Adams that he signed for me. Oh, wow. Like I that. love his Batman. Yeah, so do I. That's one of my favorites. To me, I to me, it. like the yeah. Neil Adams Batman is like the definitive Batman. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a bunch of his comics. I've been collecting comics. Well, I still have the comics that I got off the newsstands when I was about five or six. Wow. They're not in good shape. No, no, of course, but, but still. <laughs> I still have them. That's um, really cool to have. Yeah. And um, I just went back and looked, and I have John Burns, I think the first 20 issues of Sensational She-Hulk. Yep. Still in perfect condition from when I bought them. Um, but the other Hot Toys that I pre-ordered was um, Black Widow. Which the... Oh, you got okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Blackwood. Those are great figures too. And then, although I wanted the original Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot one. Right. Um, I ended up just getting the 1984 version. Yeah, that hasn't come out yet. No, 
but uh, it should. I mean, that, that, that's more of the comic book remember. colors. I mean, I yeah. like. I I've got the so the you know the Batman v Superman version. I think I have the deluxe Justice League version where she has the cloak. The the I have that. I the have that one. Uh, yeah, and then I bought the. I, I I'm very happy that I did because I bought the um the golden armor from Wonder Woman eighty four, but I basically bought it because it's Kingdom Come, the yeah. comics, and so I I've got my uh, yeah I've got my third party, my third party Kingdom Come figure here. This isn't a hot toy, but it's um it's it's a third party figure with a Fison body, and uh, I had to get it because I love Kingdom Come. But I'm gonna put my golden armor. Wonder Woman with him because she's more Kingdom Come to me than that she was Wonder Woman eighty four. Yeah, I, not my favorite movie. Um, I hate but it. But I wanted to get the Gal Gadot head, head sculpt. Yeah, yep. But the, I think the Wonder Woman. I think the one that you're getting is probably going to be the best Gal Gadot head sculpt. That's good. So that's and that's cool. I like the colors on that that figure. The brighter, more comic book. Colors. I was hoping they'd do a Maxwell Lord figure, but I figured I knew they wouldn't. And it's funny because that's another thing I hated. I hated. I like Pedro Pascal as an actor quite a bit, but I hated the way they wrote it. Maxwell Lord. I hated it. No, because I have all of the. Um, I went to college at San Jose State. Oh, okay. Because I'm from California, but I've been living up in the Seattle area since '93. Oh, I'm from Seattle. I know. Yeah. Um, I live up in Monroe, which is yeah, northeast there. So yeah. Um, are you ever coming up to Emerald City Comic Con anytime? You know what's funny? I I've never like not that I expect to be invited, but the fact that I've gone back, like I used to go to every convention in Seattle growing up. I've never, no one's ever asked me from the Comic Con to go, and I, you know, I've been speaking at san diego for since 94 and i mean i don't i don't know anybody at the emerald because it is, isn't it this weekend yeah i didn't go this year because just because of covid risk yeah yeah i uh problem. but i would love to go I, I mean i'd love to do panels up there it'd be fun to go back home and you know it's it's really interesting um so my dream in life was one of them was to get a movie in, into the seattle international film festival because mm -hmm. I grew up going every year, I'd get a full series pass. And so <laughs> while it wasn't the movie I would have hoped, Hills Run Red, I took the Hills Run Red, this horror movie to, to Seattle, and it got in as a midnight screening. And it was great. Everybody came, you know, it was a raucous screening. People who I went to high school with came and it was so much fun. And it was it was literally a dream fulfilled. Yeah. And at the at, at the uh, uh, the party, the last night, the the final party, the closing night party, a guy comes up to me and he explains, he said that there's there's a website called Fool Serious for full series pass holders, which I was one for eight years. And and they people rate the movies. And he had this kind of gleeful expression and he goes, and guess whose movie got the worst rating of the festival? And yeah. I'm like, I don't know, yours. And I was like, okay. When it was such a, it was such a weird, because, because he, I don't know if he wanted to, what, it, I don't know what his, but, but then I went and looked on the, the full serious site and only one person rated the movie. It wasn't like it got rated by a bunch of people. And, and I, I, what was so interesting to me was that growing up in Seattle, when filmmakers would come and I saw a lot of movies I hated but I always loved it when the filmmakers of those movies would speak, you know, you'd learn something and you were always respectful of filmmakers and, yeah. and you would never say something like, I remember there was a director named Jackie Hong who directed and she was, she was a spitfire a pistol. I loved her, but I really didn't like her movie blood diner that they showed as one of the midnight movies. I didn't like it at all, but I liked her and I loved her listening to her speak. And it was really interesting because I realized that the world, that, that was a moment. So I didn't, it didn't, it wasn't that it bothered me that the movie got badly reviewed. I didn't care about that. What bothered me was somebody actually came up to me and tried to make me feel bad. And, and the funny thing about it was I, this movie was supposed to be a $350,000 movie that we were going to make independently. 
I was able to turn it into a Warner Brothers movie and Joel Silver was our executive producer. So in no universe would I ever feel bad about the film ever because it was such a personal and professional triumph for me. But, but to have somebody come up and wantonly try and make you feel bad, I thought that was really interesting. And it made me realize that the world has changed, that social media has changed the world in the sense that no longer the people that held full series pass holders, their little click was more important than the movies that they had come to see. And I thought that was more, I, th I thought that was a very interesting lesson that I have taken with me since 2009. Yeah. Whatever that means. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that would happen at Emerald City Comic Con and I wouldn't care, but still for my hometown to suddenly, it, it Seattle changed. There, there, there's been a, and whenever I go back and I yeah. usually go back at least once a year, it's a very different place than I left. Yeah, it's it has changed a lot. Um, even I mean, Emerald I still love city the city. Has, yeah, I do too. I don't get down there as much as I'd like to anymore, just because you know. But um, I used to go down quite frequently in the summer because I was a, a Seattle Storm ticket holder. Oh wow, cool! Season pass or season ticket holder. Uh, the new stadium, the new uh, arena is beautiful, though. Oh, yeah, I really want I haven't seen it. Do you, is that the Seattle Center? Yeah. The, that the, arena has been remodeled and everything? Yeah, it's the Climate Pledge Arena now instead of the Key Arena. Yeah, oh, I loved, I, 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 that, I, in the Key Arena, I went to my first rock concert. I saw Kiss, <laughs> Kiss on the Dynasty Tour. It's my first rock concert I ever went to. <laughs> um, my first concert, well, my new my first concert in the new arena, the you know revamped arena, was um, Evanescence and Hailstorm. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But they came there last November. Did so they the did they arena. tear down the old call the old arena and rebuild it from scratch? They kept the roof. Right. Um, they, I didn't see it when it was torn down, but I think they tore down most of it and rebuilt it but it's all completely um like carbon neutral materials oh yeah because the roof though was cool <laughs> yeah no they kept the roof yeah um there's a whole video on how they did it and everything it oh, i'll have to look up. i wonder if it's on youtube I yeah i think if you go to their website it has a um like how they put it together and yeah yeah it. for sure nice shadow thank you so much sorry to have to cut you off i'm so sorry we're just trying to get through and i know rob i don't know time wise how you're doing but it's already I'll, four so i know that yeah you have i've got a little time, bit more time, time but not much okay. but uh shadow thanks for becoming a new member and uh it was good to meet you face to face and just some quick uh uh uh, super chats harris mcgrade joined as a member so thank you for joining well, thank you so much uh wesley nimella hello rob are your movies uh that are available on physical media on a website uh and what is the favorite movie that you have made have a better day rob well i guess my favorite movie i've made is free enterprise but you can't it's out of print mm -hmm. and there are two versions of it on dvd there's the pioneer version and, and there's the anchor bay version you'd want to get the anchor bay version the two disc set if you want to get it but hopefully next year is going to be its 25th anniversary yeesh um and uh hopefully we'll get it out but then all, the the hills run red. Even if you don't love the movie, there's there's eight eight to ten hours of special features on that disc, and it's a Scream Factory disc, and you can get it at um, you can get it at um, Amazon. It's a great. The special features are great. Uh, Emil Johansson uh, sends a super chat and says, "Any second, one thousand cats can dream of a better future." <laughs> Man, Man, that was the only comic book I ever gave my mom to read. And the dream then, of a thousand cats. I know it's such a great story. And then V uh, sends a super sticker for three pounds. Thank you so much, V. All right, and we've got the man Hassoni coming in right now. Hassoni, you should be the able crazy to man. Unmute. The crazy man has. What's up, Hassoni? How are you, dude? Hello. Do you hear me, Rob? Oh, I can hear you. 
Hello, Rob. It's so good to see you. It's so fucking good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, man? What have you been up to? How's your comic book? Actually, the issue three is now in the factory. Nice. For production. So we're going to have it in like maybe two weeks. It's going to be in our hand. Oh, congratulations. Physical. Thank you. Thank you. We've been ordering like thousand examples. Oh, nice. The third of the third issue, and um, we got like 200 customers from the Kickstarter, so <laughs> it's gonna be so much fun. That's great, man. In three issues, we we actually made something, you know. <laughs> I know, and that's another great so, thing. Rob, you actually made it. I want to talk today about something. Yes, 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 we made it. But today, I don't want to talk so much about the comic. I want to talk about some films, not movies, films. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which ones? Okay. First of all, you said that this movie has the best 45 minutes. And that is very, very fucking true. Wait, I can't see One the of, title. Hang on, I can't see. Oh, oh yeah, see the yeah the first hour, yes. the, first the first hour, hour of hour. Casino is a tour de force of filmmaking. A tour de fucking force of filmmaking. Yes, I mean the narrative, the storytelling, how they explain stuff. Yep. It, it's it's <laughs> it's crazy it, good. <laughs> it's it's yeah. I mean it's Martin Scorsese and 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 Robbie Richardson working at the height of their powers. I mean, it's incredible. Exactly. exactly. And Robert Richardson, he's that guy who loves to, to film yep. on film, right? Not, digi not digital. That's the right. guy, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, inc and, it's uh, an incredible movie. Yes, it is. It is. It is. And also, Rob, I want to talk about like the directors from from before, there is no one right now that that you can like compare with, with the old directors. No, I I agree with you, and I I, I think that right? um, you, you know the, the problem is I think is that the business has changed, and the yes. the the business. I mean, you know, I look at somebody like um, Spike Lee, for instance. So Spike yes. Lee's first movie was She's Gotta Have It, which was a, a breakthrough indie film, announced him as a, a, as a really interesting uh, new filmmaking voice. You know, he brought something uh, of his own experience, his own culture okay. that hadn't been seen. And then if you go and you, you follow the fact that then he got to make School Days and he got to make uh, um, uh, Do the Right Thing, but if you follow all that up and you go up to a movie like Inside Man, which is a caper movie, you know, it's a studio caper movie with all kinds of, of uh, incre I incredible love actors. Inside Man. Inside Man's love fucking it. great. Well, he got to develop love his it. craft. You know, he got to learn how to, not that he, he started, so he started with indie roots, but then worked his way up to making studio movies. But it took exactly, him a while. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it, it exactly. took him a while. He had to figure out how to. He, he did historical epics like Malcolm X and and um, those kinds of things. But nowadays, you're if you're an indie director, and you made one movie that does really well, you get plucked by the studios to go make. You know, you you become the hip thing in town, and you you suddenly are working on a hundred and fifty million dollar movie, and and nobody gets a chance to develop their own voice. And, exactly. and I think the problem with that is, is that the filmmakers of today, very few of them have the skills to be the kinds of directors that we've been watching for decades. I mean, Martin Scorsese has been around, you know, what do you make, Boxcar Bertha for Roger Corman yes. back in the early 70s. Yes. And, you know, you look at his career, he's been making movies now for 50 years. Exactly. And he's had his up yes. and down periods too. He's had periods where nobody wanted to work with him. Yes, that's true. But you know what, Rob? You could actually direct better than the guys right now. Well, I don't I know about that. Believe, <laughs> I believe that. You know? Because well, it's you have funny the right because mind. 
well, yeah, I mean, I only made, I only really directed one movie, but having produced movies and especially the being on set, like, you know, being on the set of Superman Returns or Narnia and watch these movies get made. How many people get that kind of an education? And I've never been able to utilize it again. Right. But I will. I will. Right. I will. Someday, Rob. Someday. You could come to Sweden and we can make a horror movie in Sweden. Uh, you know, I, I would love it. I would love to go to Sweden and make a horror movie. Why not? You're welcome. You're welcome. Anytime, man. I, I, I like Sweden. Anytime, Rob. I've only been there once. Yes, Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Where? I, well, I came across from uh, Norway. I mean, not Norway. From um, um, Denmark. I was only in Sweden oh, for a day. Okay, okay. You know, I just took okay, the ferry. Okay. Just took the ferry. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Nice. 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 But I, but I spent great. some time. That's I went great. to Switzerland. I went to Davos, and I went skiing for ten days. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay, yeah. Rob. Uh, I want to hear your opinion about the new movie what did you think about it uh the new predator film yes i loved it i you know I th i've watched it twice i thought it was great you know and to me yeah, the spirit of of it felt like look i still love the first predator and i i have a soft spot for predator too but predator oh, fucking love it <laughs> but predator or prey <laughs> again felt like it was fully realized it felt like they had this idea for the movie they went out and made it and it felt it felt like they set out to make a certain movie and they made it so it felt i was very fulfilled by prey because exactly. again i it felt was a good story too yeah it was a good story and it felt like they made the movie yes. they wanted to make which i think is that's um that's a, that's an important thing to because so often they they don't succeed at making the movie they wanted to make, and I thought Prey. My only regret was I wish I'd seen it in a theater. Yeah, actually, me too. They would make so much money on that. That was a big they yeah take from them, you know. <laughs> totally, honestly, and <clears throat> that me. movie will be better. If it was R-rated, you know, it yeah. isn't R-rated, right? It, I think yeah, it but it's pretty violent. I think it is. It is. It is. Is it? Uh, it is for not being R-rated. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Predator Two is pretty violent, but uh, but uh, yeah. I thought Prey was good. I liked it. It was good. Fucking loved it. I loved it. Yeah. And Sandman, I loved Sandman, but I. But I thought the last two episodes were a little bit slow. No, I can but understand I that. The ending. Have you watched the new yeah. episode that dropped? I haven't dropped. You no. got it. It's great. It's great. Yeah. You'll love it. I promise I you. It. It's really good. I'll watch it after this. Yeah, you should. Yeah, okay, You'll love okay. it. So it's like a continuity from the last episode? No. No, it's totally different. It's got it's two different episodes together. It's an animated episode, and then it's a live action episode, and it's more like earlier in the series. Okay. They're both standalone well, stories. Okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. I mean, it was uh, a special series. You know, it was like something new to see. You know, from the beginning. You know, you know when they captured him, and you know when he was. A, on the quest, you know, forget his mask when he went to hell. Oh, um, it's great. You know, when he get the sand. And my favorite episode, Rob, was actually the diner episode. Because yeah, I it, mean, was, it was fun. <laughs> yes, it was fun. People, it's funny. People love it or hate it. Yes. So, I loved yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's, I, I love the whole thing. I mean, it was just like... Seeing yeah. it, I, I I wanted to see that my whole life, and so seeing the Sandman show has been, it's just been so much fun to see it. I've loved what they've done. I can imagine that. I, I can imagine that too. That you have read the comics. I haven't read the comics. Oh yeah, I read them when they first came out. I mean, it, it's it's my favorite oh. comic series of all time. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. and now now I now oh, I can't reach. 
Um, I have yeah. the uh, the absolute editions, the um, these beautiful, beautiful hard covers um, with the whole series in it, which I which I love and would never part with. Um, I I I don't I, I'm no longer married to my single issues. I like the uh, I like the hardcover tomes when I can get them. And that's a beautiful uh, version that that one that you have there, Rob Hassoni. Yeah, the app. Thank you the so absolute. much. And by the way, Hassoni, as a comic book writer, I think Sandman is required reading. You need to uh, to check it out. I agree. Uh, hey, Rob, a thing about Prey. I, I like the movie that they gave us, but it's funny because a few years back I had thought about what could be a new sequel to Predator that would kind of change things up a bit. And I would have, my, my point was to call it Prey. And my thought was the Predator comes to Earth and then he doesn't realize that because of the prior visits, this squad has been created with weapons that they stole from <laughs> Predators that came before and he is the Prey. And it was uh, going to be like a first blood, but with a Predator. That's a gr dude. I want to see that. Don't you think movie. that should have been what? If you're gonna call it prey, the the, the predator should be the prey. You know. You like, know what? I, I think that is a that's a slam dunk pitch. That right was there. That, I just reverse the story, and he get, you know, these predators get there, and then a, a bunch of them get annihilated because this anti predator squad has has the advantage on them, and then one survives. And then yeah, it's they all about out that how, one. They track. They have an early warning system in orbit so they can track where the ship lands and they've got the they, they've adapted the clothing so they can also be invisible they've got all yeah. the tricks and, and they've and they were able to neutralize some of the tricks of this predator i mean i totally thought if you're gonna call it prey make the predator the prey but and what would be great is the predator is your protagonist exactly he you, becomes you want the predator focus. to win yeah <laughs> <laughs> or at least escape you know <laughs> Get right out of yeah it. yeah so anyway that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, I think I like the idea of now going to different time periods. You could do the sequels to this movie, just be like the next one takes place in, in Egypt, you know, or the next one right. takes place in the Roman Empire or something like that. But if you're going to call it Prey, I was thinking, oh, man, that would have been uh, there's an opportunity there to reverse the, the story and and do something new with it. So I love that idea. Anyway, uh, enough of my <laughs> dreams. Uh, let's talk to. Uh, Mario Lopez, all the way from Portugal. Welcome, Mario. Mario, how Hello. are you? How are you? Hi. Hi, Rob. Are you okay, too? Oh, yeah. And I have to ask you, how's your mom? <laughs> My mom is fine. Is really okay. Uh, I'm on vacations for 15 days, so <laughs> you, we are fine. <laughs> you Europeans, you get those great vacations. Mm -hmm. Uh. Yes, I believe so. We have uh, the right for a month of vacations. It's good. <laughs> uh, now, did you did I read that there was some fire or something in Portugal? A like, lot of fires. A lot. Yeah, a it's, lot of fires. It's terrible. Of yeah. It, it's the heat, but it's not only the heat. It's people that put the fires for various reasons. Uh, and uh, we don't have the laws uh, that... Uh, could end with the real problem because it's people that put the fires. Right. It's not the heat. The heat is the, the excuse. It's the opportunity. Oh. <laughs> I still want to come to Portugal. I can't wait. Yes. Yes. We should meet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember to, to appear today uh, because I really like this community because we can all talk and we respect each other and we follow your lead in this uh, uh, asp aspect. I want to talk about uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Rings of Power. Oh, uh, yes. Be because I don't like what I think Amazon is going to do and I don't yeah. like what the actors are saying because yeah. to me they don't understand that we, the fans, we love Tolkien's work. And for us, Tolkien is sacred. And they don't understand that. And they call us names. And they don't uh, realize that this show probably should never have been made. Peter Jackson understood that. He made the, 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 the Lord of the Rings the best thing that probably was made, the best trilogy. He respected the fans and respected us above all uh, Tolkien. Yes. So 
uh, it, it's sad. It's sad. I, I hope that the well, actors are not attacked because that's that's stupid, and they are not fans that attack the actors. Are the, these are individuals, not fans? That's my opinion. <laughs> well, I would say I would say this. I mean, on one hand, we haven't seen the show yet, and 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 actors. <laughs> You always kind of like, I'll tell you a funny story. So when I introduced or when I interviewed Patrick Stewart for the Star Trek, the next generation Blu-rays, when I sat down with him, I said to him, I said, uh, so I don't want to talk to you about Star Trek. And he was like, what, 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 what do you, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, what do you really know about Star Trek? Like, and I said to him, I go, if I asked you about the geopolitical state situation between the Klingons and the Romulan empire during the battle of Narendra three, what would you tell me? And he laughed. He goes, I don't even know what you're talking about. I go, see? And and I said, what people want to know about is they want to know about you. They want to know about you, Patrick Stewart. And so, and sure, we can talk about Star Trek and your feelings about it, but I'm more curious to hear about what, what you, Patrick Stewart, the person, the actor, the Royal Shakespeare Company member, what was it like to come to America and to be in this show? And, and, and he we were off to the races and I ended up, I, I sat with him for two, two on two separate occasions for about two hours at a time. And, and actors, they really, they, some actors now are fans of things, but I've never expected actors, especially when they're part of a franchise to know as much about the franchise as I do or any other fan, because they don't, you know, and they, they'll never know uh, because their experience of what they're doing sort of precludes them from knowing to be to be a fan to understand everything that's going on so i respect all the actors they probably are great actors too but their experience of what it means to them to be cast in these parts is a very they're coming at it from a, a completely different perspective than we are as fans of the material so i i would tend to give the actors a pass and the things that they're talking about what it means to them as as living in the real world when you can see when they talk about things like representation and all that they're speaking about how it affects them as people they're not tolkien scholars and they don't know they're not steeped in the lore or the literature and so when they come out and they talk i've always i've always given actors the benefit of the doubt because they're coming at something from a different place than we as fans are. And I think that's just something that we have to be more mindful of. And, you know, when an actress comes out and says, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a black actress and I've, I've, they've, they've never shown uh, dwarves of color in, in this universe, so it means a lot to have that kind of representation. I think she's telling the truth and she, that's absolutely true because um, in, just in general, in anything, we haven't seen enough black actors and representation it doesn't matter what it is whether it's tolkien or star wars or whatever so when an actress comes out and says something like that i don't think that she deserves to be attacked i think that she should be lauded and for for coming out and being excited to be in this role and and the fact that there are there are going to be uh, some young black girl somewhere who's four or five or six or seven is going to tune in to watch watch rings of power and is going to see this actress portraying this character and it's going to going to be like oh i love this character so from that perspective i think it's important on the other hand as a fan of tolkien i hate the fact that they're bastardizing what is essentially a work about it's it, he wanted to write a mythology about england yes. and and about a specific time and and the way he wrote it I mean, it's it's like, you know, nobody nobody ever tells somebody who's making a samurai story that there's not enough Americans in your samurai story. I mean, nobody <laughs> says that. Nobody's like, where is that person? You know, and I, when I when I was in South Korea, I never thought to myself, wow. I mean, I, what I thought to myself was, wow, there is not a lot of cultural diversity here. And I, I, I'm like, now I know what it likes. I, I know what it's like it, where, where whenever I walk into a store, somebody looks at me the whole time I'm in there like I'm going to freak out or something like i'm a loud boisterous american so you know i mean i understand you got to just take it all with a grain of salt all i can hope for is that maybe this rings of power show will be good 
and it'll tell us a great fantasy story. I mean, it's unfortunate because in the case of like Neil Gaiman and the Sandman, the Sandman is an incredibly faithful adaptation to the comics. It's incredibly faithful. And I have read garbage adaptations. I've read so many terrible scripts about the Sandman over the years. But this Sandman, and the thing is, the reason why this Sandman show will eventually overcome all of the criticisms about gender swapping or race swapping is because the show is so good and has such fealty to the source material. And eventually you're going to be like, look, man, it's a great adaptation. Quit your bitching. But Lord of the Rings, to me, I mean, Rings of Power seems to, you've got characters that in the Legendarium didn't meet for 1,500 years. These characters would never meet, and they're in the room together. I look at that, and it drives, makes me want to pull my hair out. And I'm like, why are you doing that? Because that you, you've now, you've put your own whatever story that you're telling above uh, Tolkien's story. And I don't think that's fair. And a lot of creators are doing that. They do that with Star Trek. They do that with Star Wars. And it's like, why do you got to do that? When I, I pref like Peter Jackson said, we didn't put our own personal politics in the Lord of the Rings. We were trying to be as, as, yes. as um, we were trying to be as faithful to Tolkien as we possibly could. Professor Tolkien's work was always first and foremost in our minds. But, but they should know that uh, the best way to promote the, the show uh, shouldn't be like that. For example, for all mankind, as all diversity and inclusion, and it's so well made. It's the, it's the best. And it's it's the best the diversity and inclusion on TV. It by the none. best. And the I best. never saw anyone from that show to talk about that with the audience, with the public. We don't need them to talk about those those things. We understand them. So I think that the the marketing of the Rings of Power is the worst thing I ever saw. I hope the show could be good, but uh, I'm very pessimist. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, it's funny that the show itself is not what they're selling. Yes. You know, they're trying to sell it. And I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? I mean, tell me if tell me that you're going to show us uh, the, the idea of a show set in the second age of Middle Earth. That's really cool. But even then, it looks like they've they've played so fast and loose with the mythology that their version of the second age of Middle Earth is not Tolkien's version of Middle Earth. And that's a problem. And I don't know why they thought that that but but again, I want to wait and see how it goes. I mean, having worked on, you know, when we were doing Lord of the Rings and documenting those movies, I was in New Zealand for months at a time talking to all the people that made those films, you know, for the blue, for the DVD special features. And all anybody talked about was Tolkien, Tolkien, Tolkien. Nobody talked about anything but that. So. Thank you so much. Great to see you, Mario. And here. Mario, uh, say hi to your mom for me. Yes. Hi to your mom all the way in Portugal. And yep. here is uh, Darth Plato uh, coming to join us. Darth, you should be able to unmute. Oh, sure. What's up, man? Uh, do you hear me okay? Last time my mic yeah, was you, messed up. You sound great. Okay, good. Uh, since you were talking about uh, range of power, let's continue with that. Um, All right, then. <laughs> um, one of the biggest differences about uh, the Second Age and after the Second Age that people don't realize is in the Second Age, the world was flat. And it didn't become round until after the Third Age. The Numenor. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big difference. So I wonder that, you know, that's mind. something that's something not many people bring up. Mm -hmm. That's a very salient point to bring up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I also ask you, let me ask you, and, and come, pardon me if I sound long winded. Um, do you remember the original script or writing that George Lucas made for Star Wars? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've I, I've never actually read like his handwritten script for star wars but i it mean i've read very different than the movie oh it's very different than the movie right so imagine trying to make a future movie where they take that original writing and star wars and try to bring it together and make it and have it make sense well you, you know it's, do it. it's really interesting because dark horse comics published a um they published a comic called the star wars no no don't eat my prince figure. Um, I cannot have my prince action figure damaged in any way, shape, or form. 
um, uh, by Sebastian, the crazy dog. But yeah, and they, they did. They published a comic. It's beautiful. I have a, a slipcase edition of it. It's totally different. It's totally different. Yeah. And it would not reconcile itself with what got made. Right. But in Tolkien's unfinished writing, the unpublished writings, they're, right. un- they're contradictory. Yes. You can't put them together. Well, and also, I mean, this you've got the Silmarillion, but even the Silmarillion was a compilation, wasn't it? You know? I mean, finished. yeah, it's and it's so that's a really great point. You know, I've never I've never heard anybody actually make that point in that way before. But that is a very, very good point. I'm going to steal that. I'll give you credit, though. I appreciate that. I have a feeling that that's what they're going to do with um, Galadriel. Now, with Galadriel's character, I'm talking about just the Fellowship of the Ring. Now, right. The, the novel. The character has a very real uh, Cersei Calypso feel to it. That you see in the Odyssey, right? I don't have a Xena warrior princess feel to it, or Red Sonia feel to it, right? But in the Ring to Power, it looks like it looks like it's um, she. Was, you know she looks like she looks like Brienne of Tarth. She does look like Brienne of Tarth, and I, 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 I you know that those writers are like, yeah, we got to make her more like. That's probably exactly what they said in the uh-huh. writers' room. And 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 to me, that's problematic. That's when that's when things, because what's interesting to me is they want they want Tolkien's characters to be other characters than what they are. And you know, I I felt the same way about like as an example, Spock on Strange New Worlds. They they this idea that well, Spock wasn't fully formed when he was aboard the Enterprise, and that's why he smiled. They took one smile that he makes in the, well, the cage and the menagerie. And they, they, they try and base his whole um, personality around that. And it, like, well, he's not as in control of his emotions. It's like, that's ridiculous. That's, 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 that's dumb. And then these, these writers, because they want the ability to add something to these beloved characters that have been around for a long time. And, and I think that's pro- a problematic way of thinking. You, you can't go in and, and, and expect to change characters like, well, you know, and, and it immediately the, the politics of today is not going to be the politics of 10 years from now or the politics of 20 years from now. Politics is constantly shifting. Social mores are changing. Things are changing all the time. And so to put your personal politics in front of the author's original intent with a character, I think is one, a fool's errand. And two, you're not you're doing yourself a disservice. I mean, already Star Trek Discovery's dated. So yes. and God knows what, what Rings of Power is gonna be like. Because the funny thing about it is human history is horrible. Human beings are horrible. Human beings, we 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 were enslaving people for thousands of years. I mean, we were kill everybody was enslaving everybody. People were uh, there, there was there was there was lords owned people in in England. You know, you were you the landowners. You were part of what they owned. I mean, we're a horrible bunch. And if you want to try and go back and recontextualize history based on today's politics, you're always going to lose. I mean, and and I don't understand why people like just just do like I read a really interesting thing today that I didn't know, and it made me it made me want to find out if this is true that the first Top Gun class, there were two, there were, there were both white aviators and black aviators competing in the first Top Gun class and the black aviators won. And, and, and then they discontinued the trophy. And um, for like 50 years, there was no Top Gun trophy after that. And I was like, that's fascinating shit. And it's like, that happened. If that happened, that's true because we were racist fucks. You know, and and the guys who won the trophy didn't even get to like take credit for it. Who cares what color you are if you're the best flyer, get the award. I but, that's right. uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I and I read that today on Facebook. I don't know if that's true, but I was like, right. wow, that's fascinating stuff. I can't stand and and to try and go back and recontextualize Tolkien yeah. because somebody wants representation today is that's what I don't like. You know, I think that's stupid. Yeah. But, the I mean, past I, I, is like uh, another country. They do think differently. Yeah. 
And it's so weird how we want to change our past. I mean, the, the whole point is those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Well, in that case, we'll just, well, even if you did know the past, you're just going to just stand there and say why other people make just these same mistakes. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's like, let's all go, be, let's all go be communists today. Yeah, when I was, uh, when I was, yeah. te- when I was teaching, I, I said, uh, I used, I used this, I used the term of phrase, the, uh, lesson learned. Yes. And, um, well, like when we talked about history and, uh, this British gentleman came up to me and said, you know, over in, uh, over at the London school, we have a different phrase. We say, uh, lesson identified because we know that when the lesson back could be learned. Right. That's what he said. Right. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I mean, definitely. it's like it's been in the news a lot that there, there's the Russians took over the largest nuclear power facility. It's in Ukraine. And you're like, gosh, you know, Ukraine, that's the only where's the last giant big, the biggest natural or man-made disaster in history was at Chernobyl, also in Ukraine. You guys are fighting a war outside of a giant nuclear power plant. How about not do that? How about not do that? Let's not do that. But they're doing it. <laughs> I mean, you just lessons learned, lessons identified. <laughs> when that something happens there, it's like let's not go, let's not fight around a nuclear power plant, or let's let's turn it off first. You know. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in range of power, but um, you know, to be to be fair, I I like to say, wait until it comes out. Yeah, and form your opinion. Sure. That I think Michael Lita likes to say that a lot. He's absolutely right. Watch first for an opinion. That later. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 the thing, because here's the thing. Let's say, OK, if it's not if it's not if it doesn't live up to Professor Tolkien's work, what if it's a good show? Like, what if the story is good right. and, and the show is entertaining and it's well made and it's well acted? Maybe it's not Tolkien's story, but it could still be a good story. And if it's a good story and if it's compelling television, I'll watch that. You know, I don't particularly think that the the Star Trek stories they're telling in even on Strange New World are particularly good. <laughs> you know, and right. and and I'll be the first to say that what they did to the Gorn and the follow up comments from like Kiva Goldsman to me was like inexcusable. I mean, the way the way he, it was just I'm like you, wow. Gorn or a disease? I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, they're Gorn are just evil. I'm like, did you watch Arena? I mean, it's it's you missed the point, and and I that I hate. But and look, so I'll wait and see. I want Rings of Power to be great. It's the most expensive TV show ever made, and I hope it's great. I don't know how much time do we have. Uh, I don't know. Thirty uh, seconds. Want... Thirty seconds, Darth. <laughs> well, go in ahead, case, Darth. In that case, I'll just uh, I'll tell the entire history of the Vietnam War right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's good to talk to you. Always good to see you, sir. And Thank you, Darth. Good to out. see you. All right. Sorry. Keeping an eye on the timer here, Rob. It's uh, all good. Roger's around. Is Roger up next? Yes. And then Israel? Ro- uh, Roger is up next, but a couple of super chats. Uh, Martin Ogden became a new member. Thank you, Martin. Oh. All right, Martin. Cardinal Sin, uh, he became a new member, too, and says, hey, Laser Bob. Do you know what they did to Laser Bob? <laughs> it was you and me, Laser Bob. Just want to drop a like and say hi. Gil, how you doing? By the way, I still have to send you your signed Hills Run Red stuff for Dave Parker to sign, which I've had for, what, six months? I just haven't seen Dave in the flesh, so he hasn't been able to sign. And I haven't seen, as a matter of fact, I don't think I've seen Dave Parker in the flesh for quite some time because I also have to have him sign um, Dieter's Hills Run Red disc. And lastly, uh, V says, I'm sorry if you heard he is before, but I had... I thought of you doing a show connected ish, tissue or issue maybe about the ways things in film from the past in comics that people have not read or remakes and more. Don't know if that's something, it looks like it's a conversation that maybe you had started with B. I'm not really sure. Oh um, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe. Okay. I mean, it's it. Yeah. Um, look, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, I, I don't know. You know, we, we now have these characters. We have been around some of them for, I mean, She-Hulk is a 42-year-old character that was created by Stanley, right? 1980, and you know, I've seen different people are throwing out, "Oh, this is feminist claptrap," <laughs> but I don't, I don't think what Jennifer Walters tells Bruce 
is necessarily something that isn't true. Anyone who's mm-hmm. had a sister or a mother or whatever, you know, and she makes that thing about I'm angry all the time. Mm-hmm. This is a this is this happens to women all the time. And and she's saying she's saying something that was that's very true. Yeah. And people are like, this is the most feminist thing ever. I'm like, well, I what's wrong with that? And it's a great way to tie it back to Banner's comment in the original Avengers and then show uh, well, that, you know, hey, the the way that we're wired and the way society impacts us makes it so that we deal with anger in different ways. And so in a way, she's able to control it way, way more early than Banner was able to, you know? Yeah. And that was kind of the point. That was the point. And and it was referring back to something that happened when we first met the Hulk in in, uh, Avengers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah. Oh, well. All right. Uh, But anyway, uh, uh, thanks to V. I'm sorry if the comment was a little botched up there, but thanks for the super chat. I appreciate we appreciate it. And then we've got uh, Roger coming up. Roger, you should be able to unmute now. Hello, Rob. How are you doing? How are you, sir? Oh, very good. I was actually doing some napping this afternoon. And I was, oh, <laughs> look, look what's going on here. Napping you- this afternoon. Well, it's good to have you here. I'm glad you got up. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, I just watched um, She-Hulk, and I enjoyed that. Um Tatiana Mazzoni just got so much um, um, appeal, you know, so much uh, talent on her. It's, you know, because I never did go watch her previous show, the um, Orphan Black. The Orphan Black. Yeah, I never did watch much of that, but she is really. Uh, she's you know, a great got actress. A lot of charisma. Yeah, she's great. And, and it's great casting. And I thought the show was fun. And my God, it was that must have been one of the most expensive half hours of television ever made with those effects. <laughs> I mean, my God, watching two Hulks on screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the the Banner Hulk, they've got that down because they've had 12, uh, They've well, they've had it's 10 years of R&D to get that CG model right. It's incredible. You know, and, and I thought, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought, it, I can't wait to see what, what they do with it. Yeah, I, like I said, this is Mazzani, just herself, I think she can carry most of the show by herself. Uh, yeah, and look, I've got to say, I was a big fan of Miss Marvel. You know, I thought the Miss Marvel show was great too, and the acting, the acting they got, the actors, that ensemble cast in Miss Marvel was terrific. Mm-hmm. Um, really, really good. Yeah. So, so, so and, and I agree for you. I what caught the, you know, I was surprised this morning that chapters of uh, the Sandman. Oh, dude. Was, I particularly liked the one about the, you know, the muse. Uh, pers- Calliope. Yeah, Calliope. That's it, Calliope. And uh, that was a really, I really enjoyed that one. Oh, yeah. And, and her relationship with Dream uh, and the, the product of their union plays out in the Sandman mythos. So. Now, I have to hand it to Dream. He, he had his little uh, share of uh, romances through the mm-hmm. eons, apparently. Oh, yeah. Although, you know, if you're in Africa during the first people and you have a girlfriend and she spurned you, you throw her to hell for 10,000 years. Yeah, yeah, he he seemed to have a little bit more compassion for uh, K- Calliope than he did for his uh, former other ex. Seemed like. Yeah, because Nada, she she dissed him pretty hard, <laughs> but you know what? That comes into that play comes in season back. two. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> in, in, in my very favorite, in my very favorite uh, Sandman storyline, season of mists, uh, basically Death says, uh, you know, you're a dick. And uh, I think you should make amends with Nada and get her out of hell because you're a yeah. dick. Yeah. And uh, it that. goes yeah. from there. It starts there. <laughs> and, and I do like that character of death. And that sounds like something she would say because she really doesn't give. <laughs> no. You know, no. I, the, the uh, uh, Miss Baptiste, uh, her, her name, she's incredible. I mean, you know, a lot of people, again, a lot of people complain that she doesn't look like a pale faced pixie goth chick from London circa 1985 or whatever. But, you know, as we saw, we saw Dream himself in episode four appear as a black man. Mm -hmm. So because back when Dream first was hanging out with human beings, there were only black people on the earth Mm -hmm. so that the endless were that way. They were they were before they turned pale faces. They were, they were black people. They were, they looked like black Africans. That's all part of the mythology. And, uh, I love the, the girl who plays death. I love, I mean, she has such a great face 
the know, compassion so when when yeah. she does her job. I mean, she she makes me want to cry every time. Like when she went up to the the old man playing the violin or the uh, the just I loved. May I say the Shema? Now, by the way, that was right out of the comic. Mm-hmm. When when he says the Shema Israel, I don't know. I mean, it was it was so great, and uh, I loved. I mean, just seeing these scenes that I've been reading over and over again for for over thirty years to see them realized. On, I mean, the sound of her wings. That episode looked just like the comic. Just like putting up the hand to catch the soccer ball. I'm like, oh my! It was right out of the comic. It was so good. I loved it. All right. Yeah. Um, one other thing I, I saw. Uh, I caught the Sam Raimi's uh, director commentary on um, Doctor Strange. I haven't watched it yet. How is it? How is that it, commentary? It's really good. And the one thing, the one uh, Easter egg on it is that, you know, they're in the uh, the Illuminati, um, uh, the, um, that, the chamber, that, that chamber, that huge statue that he used to slam on top of Captain Marvel. Right. That's actually a statue of Xena, the warrior princess. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's yeah, he was he was the executive director. Yeah. Right. Day. Yeah, his company produced that. Yeah. 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 I didn't know that. I got to go back and watch that again. I, That's hilarious. I always, I always wondered who that was because I, I I tried to there wasn't any comment about that when the movie came out. But yeah, it's it's, it's old Zena. Wow. <laughs> That's great. I didn't know that. But Rob, it's good to see you again, and uh, you know. And I hope hope it's going all, all real in the new uh, the new observatory and well, yeah, it's good. I mean, we're finally getting everything situated, you know, squared away, which is always a good thing. I did I did catch some of your marathon medal the other <laughs> day. That was that was crazy. And with Mikey, <laughs> eight, eight hours. <laughs> I know it's almost like you're uh, you know you used to have those anniversary shows that would go. Yeah, I, I'm. I am going to do the thou- the thousand episode if I ever get there. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go for a thousand hours. I mean, a thousand minutes. <laughs> okay, a thousand minutes. I don't even know how long that would be, but yeah, it'd be pretty funny. Yeah, well, I remember that song that five hundred twenty five thousand however many minutes. Yeah, for- <laughs> yeah, from rent. <laughs> from rent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, Rob, take it easy, and we'll talk to you later. All right. It's good to see you, man. Yeah. All right, Roger. Take care. Thank you so much, Roger. Great to see you. And last but certainly not least, we've got Israel coming up. Let me go ahead and unmute you now. Israel, you should be able to jump Hello, in. Hello, sir. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to uh, the member chat. Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound, you okay. sound, you sound uh, great. I, I didn't see like the, the outline thing for the other people. Okay, cool. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm looking at your your graphic novels. Your your is that manga behind you? Uh, these are my Sword Art Online uh, light novels. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I got uh, this. Oh, oh! I wanted to show you this. I don't really have anything to talk about, so we're just gonna goof off for a few minutes. That's um, fine with me. I like to goof off. So I got this for my birthday. So I actually should have brought this up on the last member chat, but it's fine. Uh, this is i don't know if you can read it it's a transformers versus star trek comic yes. book yeah idw published that yeah i i haven't read it because i i don't know too much about star trek i've only seen the the first movie what but uh, uh <laughs> the hell you say <laughs> well, uh, rob's like get off this call and go watch them now <laughs> no, no it's okay it's all right um yeah uh, the enterprise i know is an autobot in that comic so I, I did not know cool. that. The Enterprise is, I love that. The Enterprise as Autobot. The Enterprise is a Transformer. I guess that's pretty cool. Wow, that is that um, that is pretty cool. So, oh, uh, it transforms. Yeah, I was going to go see uh, Star Trek because I saw the first one in theaters when they re released it earlier this year. The motion picture? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and I was going to go see uh, The Wrath of Khan is the next one, right? Yes. Okay, I was going to see that one when it's releasing, but it's releasing the same weekend that me and my dad will actually be up in LA for the uh Hollywood Bowl uh John Williams thing. Oh right. So, right. Well, you should probably go see it here. Now, w- where are you coming from? Where are you at now? Uh I'm in Texas. Oh, you're in Texas. Okay. Cuz cuz um Fernando Barrero is coming to see that as well, who was in the chat oh. today. Flying in from the East Coast to check that out. Um 
have you seen it before? Uh, no, it's awesome. I mean, okay. the hall, the hall, it's it, the, the, the Hollywood Bowl venue. It's so great. You know, it's all outside. It's open air. And it's it's you. It's on a hill, and the sound is incredible in there. Yeah, I've seen and pictures. It looks amazing. It's amazing, it, 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 and, and we don't know how long John Williams will be with us. Being yeah. that he's ninety, and you're going with your dad. You said? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, how cool is that? Yeah, I only convinced him uh, to because we. The only way I would be able to go is if we both split the payment. <laughs> right. So so uh, the way I convinced him, I was like. Uh, it was the day that they announced uh, that John Williams announced that he was going to be retiring. Right. I was like, see, now we never know when he's going to not be here. And then he was like, okay, I guess we'll go. And I was like, yes. So, yeah. I, I mean, it, no, you know what though? It'll, it, do, do you and your dad go to concerts? Do you, have you done, are, are you close with your dad? Do you do this uh, kind of stuff? We don't really do concerts, but yeah, we go see movies all the time. Yeah. You guys, I'm telling you, it'll be a great experience. You guys as a father son outing, what a great mm-hmm. outing. Yeah, I mean, his oh, favorite uh, film franchise is uh, Star Wars, so oh, so yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be great. Yeah, and they show clips, they show scenes from the movie when they play the music, and it's it's gonna be. Uh, I think this is gonna be really special because it might be the last one. Yeah, you know, and um, it was funny. Um, I went a couple years ago, and I was thinking I really love John Williams' score for the movie 1941, mm-hmm. and there's a military march at the beginning that I just have always loved that military march. And I'm, I, I was like, it starts out with a, a little flute that goes. And then, dun, 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 dun. and I'm like, God, you know what? It'd be so cool if, mm-hmm. if they play the 1941 March. And I'm like, they're never going to do that. And then I heard the little flute and I'm like, no way. And they played the 1941 right. March, you know, and there, and it was, it was like, Oh man, this is this truly is magical. He figures out a way to make yeah. it magical, and it 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 is magical. So you guys are gonna have a great time. Awesome. Well, uh, I don't know if you're going, but if you are, I hope to accidentally bump into you. And yeah, I picture. do not have tickets, but that doesn't oh, ever okay. stop me because uh, you know <laughs> o- o- only because this year we we moved into a new house, so right, the, yeah, 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 disposable yeah. income kind of went away. <laughs> I got you. So, but um. But you never know, because sometimes I've been called at the last minute to go. Here's okay. the thing, though. Here's what's really fun about the Hollywood Bowl. Um, I don't know. Where where are you staying in Hollywood? Are you staying around Hollywood? Uh, uh, the Lowe's Hotel. Okay, the Lowe's is right down the street from the bowl. Yeah. So what you got to do is, like, get a picnic basket, mm-hmm. you know, and, and bring in some food with you. I don't know if you can bring in alcohol anymore. You used to be able to. Okay. Maybe they'll let you, but but you can. You'll just be able to walk up the street. It's probably about I don't know, maybe less than a mile, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and you go right up the street to the Hollywood Bowl. It's awesome. You, yeah. It's a great uh, uh, I, the reason we're going to the Lowe's is because uh, we wrote in to the the John Campia show and we asked what hotel John recommended. Oh, us to stay oh. At, and he was like, "Oh, stay at the Lowe's." I remember that. Okay, and yeah. well, here's the thing about the Lowe's is is it it's at Hollywood and Highland, mm-hmm. so the Lowe's is right now Hollywood and Highland. First of all, there's you know a homeless problem or whatever. It's Hollywood, but it's it's right by the Chinese Theater, yeah. The TCL, you've got to go. See, I don't know what what do you know what date? I don't know. I don't know what movie's gonna be playing there. Whatever movies, go and see a movie in that theater. No, I, I've thought about it. I want to see uh, uh, Wrath of Khan, but we're gonna. I'll, I'll probably wait till it's like a little bit closer to see what the like yeah, I don't know if Rath, if Ratha Khan would be playing. You want to go only in the big auditorium, in the okay. IMAX theater, and whatever. Okay. Probably Top Gun's probably still going to be playing there. <laughs> right. But even if it is, it's worth going to see uh, a movie in that theater because right. it's incredible. It's what? Incredible. Um, where do you recommend in the theater uh, if you had like a best choice? Oh, I'll sit? tell you. Row, row N or M, right row in the middle. N, I'm going to write that down. Row, row N, yeah, row N or M, or you know O and P. Um, somewhere in those, sometimes though, the chairs are kind of, they're old, they're kind of sprung sometimes, but, right. but anywhere in there and you sit, you want to sit in the center. And the thing is what it is, it's basically dead center. You, you're, you're, you're dead on with the giant IMAX screen. Mm-hmm. So you're not looking up or down. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's great. It's great. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I know that that's like the most famous theater in the world. So I really want to go. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, fun. It's fun to go there. 
Yeah, my dad's trying to make me go to the ocean as well. I don't want to go because uh, I have a thalassophobia. I have a fear of the ocean. Uh, so I, I don't know if I'll go. <laughs> well, just stay away from the ocean. You, you should. There's places to go, like, um, you know, going out to, like, Malibu, you know, mm -hmm. and just seeing Malibu. There's actually, there's this great, it's, it's not a dive. Do you like seafood? Yeah, I love okay. seafood. Okay. So there's there's a there's a there's a um, it's it's literally this little hole in the wall with just picnic tables out back called the Real Inn, okay. And it's right where Malibu starts. It's right on PCH Pacific Coast Highway, mm -hmm. and they they just bring in fresh. It's like a fish market. They bring in fresh food and they cook it, and you you sit in the back at this that the um, picnic tables and eat. But it's I mean it's like it's awesome. I love the Real Inn, and um, it's it's fun because you know. Whether you actually go to the beach, you don't have yeah. to go to the beach, but you can drive along PCH and see the ocean. Yeah. So you're you're not you don't have to be anywhere near it, mm -hmm. but it is beautiful, and you'll be there in September, so the weather should be spectacular. Yeah, I, I, I was checking what the the weather was going to be like, and it's like I'm sure you've heard of the heat wave in Texas. Oh yeah. Oh man. Um. Yeah, it's going to be like 20 degrees lower than what has been here, so it'll be like an AC. California. Yeah, I mean, and, and when you're at the water, it's 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 20 or 25 degrees colder at the beach than it is in Hollywood, right? So okay, it's going to be perfect. Then yeah, you'll love it. But I mean, it's just it's it going down. You gotta you gotta see. Even if you just drive up to Malibu and go to, you know, Point Doom, where they shot the end of Planet of the Apes. God yeah. damn you all to hell. <laughs> um, it's cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's fun to go there. So yeah. you should. Awesome. Uh, okay, I did think of something to talk about. Um, so She-Hulk, obviously, everybody's talking about She-Hulk. They are. Um, and and I like how you guys ha described it on 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 the John Campia show, where it's not anti-men, it's it's anti-asshole. And the way that um, uh, I forgot the the main girl's name, uh, Jennifer uh, Walters. Yes, uh, She-Hulk. Uh, yeah, She-Hulk. Uh, uh, Jennifer, um, the way she was talking about like her struggles and and like how she's always like holding in that anger and stuff, it didn't offend me as a man, but it did like like terrify me. Like I'm scared like that I would be contributing to that without realizing it. So now I'm like going around asking like my sisters and my mom if there's anything I do that like like causes them to feel uncomfortable or anything like that. So I think I think the show for me at least an artist objective. For me, at least, it's kind of had like a, a healthy like introspection where I can kind of analyze my own quirks and see if I'm making other people feel uncomfortable. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, just I noticed that you have uh, anime girl characters behind you. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the thing that I, I find so strange is that is that we as men are biologically hardwired to objectify women. You know, when we see women, beautiful women, you know, we have a response to that. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that there's nothing wrong with acknowledging the fact that we are built a certain way and that our, our DNA, our biology has, has dealt us certain cards, you know, in terms of women have to bear children. We cannot bear children. Women have to bear them. And then we have to protect women while they're bearing children. So the species can perpetuate from a biological standpoint. So, you know, when it goes all the way back to the, our actual biology, we have to remember that, you know, women are not, they've been treated as second class citizens or property or whatever throughout human history. And, and there are vestiges of that, that are, that are, that are a, a part of our culture that we just have to remember and be like, yo, look, don't be an asshole. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and now we live in a world where, where women and, you know, anybody, I have sisters and, and they'll tell you it, it's always been harder for women to succeed in the workplace in certain arenas than it has for men because of certain biases that exist in our culture. And, um, you know, the fact is I've seen it. You walk down the street in Hollywood, you'll see somebody cat call a woman. You'll see, Oh baby, what's up? The people will go walk up to her and give her a hard time. I mean, that, that happens to think that that doesn't happen and that, that she's just calling out. She's just saying what the normal experience of a lot of women are on a daily basis. Doesn't make it some feminist tract. It's more there. It's more uh, pragmatic. I mean, this is just what happens and this will, this is what I have to put up with. And, you know, I thought I thought they dealt with it in a really great way. And like Roberto says, that it was a callback to at the same time with the first Avengers movie. When we first, you know what the secret is of being the Hulk? I'm always angry. 
you know, and, and that's, that was really an interesting callback. And I thought that was good writing. So, you know, and, and what's, and their family, you know, that's another thing. Their family, their, you know, their extended family. So it, it's, it's not like when, when, when she's talking to Bruce, she's not talking down to him. She's talking to him because they're family members and they can say whatever they really need to say. This is what I liked. I like the fact that you ask your sisters. See, the fact is that you would turn around and ask your sisters, is there anything I do is exactly what people should do. You watch a TV show, it brings up something, and rather than blame somebody or accuse somebody of something, you go, huh, I wonder if I do any of that. And you went and asked. I mean, that's what great entertainment does. It makes you think about your own behavior and you wonder. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I would say just the opposite. That's the way more, more of us should be. So kudos to you, mister, for doing just that. Yes, thank you so much, Israel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Rob, uh, Tom mentioned earlier that a thousand minutes would be 16 hours. So just so you know. <laughs> that, can be, that can be done. Well, not only could it be done, we, maybe we could take turns. We, you could have yeah. some of us kind of help in and, and kind of do like a marathon. Maybe we could even do a fundraiser or something. Dude, and there would have to be you you and you and Montana have got to do a uh, an all Spanish. Maybe, oh, my God. We got to get it going. We got to get I'd it going. Have, uh, you know, and, and, and I'll bring in Polly from Latino Slant. Yeah. Have the three of you on. That would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that, it would be great because then I could just go kick it for a couple hours, take a nap. Exactly. It'll be like the Jerry Lewis telephone. He would take his right. breaks, remember? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, that would be hilarious. That would be awesome. That would be we awesome. totally do that. Yeah. Well, that was so. it, uh, Rob. I think we're we're able to let you go. It's been only, what, uh, almost three hours. So it's actually uh, on the short side of things today. I know. We did a good job. Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for um, for hosting this chat again. And of course, I want to thank all of our members of this channel. Thank you for being a member. It's been too long. I mean, normally we like to do these bi-weekly, but um, uh, it's summer's no little... hard. Summer summer gets gets the best of us. So yeah, but I want to thank everyone for being member a member. And there is, um, uh, Lael and Arm and I will be going on tonight for midnight musings, and uh, at nine o'clock Pacific time. Uh, because I have to, I have to get up very early tomorrow to go somewhere to go watch or see or experience something. I can't admit that I'm seeing or whatever, something, something like that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, but this was great. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rob. We'll see you later tonight and everybody else. Thank you so much for joining today. See you later. Yes, it was great. See you, everyone. Bye-bye.